Écoutez, merci moi pour mes lunettes. Première chose, bienvenue à tous. Et donc, au nom du bureau de la Société française Shakespeare, je suis heureuse de vous accueillir pour notre congrès annuel. Et je voudrais d'abord remercier la Fondation Dutch de la Meurthe de nous accueillir, comme tous les ans, très généreusement. Euh, je remercie également le Centre euh, euh, Interlangue, image, texte, euh, non, texte, image, langage, de ton aide euh, pour l'organisation de cet événement. Et donc, pour le, euh, le thème de cette année, Shakespeare à la loupe, l'art du détail. Donc, l'idée de départ était, bah, selon moi, d'aller peut-être à l'encontre de la vision hugolienne romantique de Shakespeare, euh, Shakespeare qui est pour euh, Victor Hugo cet homme océan qui suscite chez lui des visions de grandeur. Donc je, vous en, je, je ne vous en lirai qu'une partie, malheureusement, parce que sinon je peux lire pendant des heures et des heures. Ses colères et ses apaisements, ce tout dans un, ses, cet inattendu dans l'immuable, ce vaste prodige de la monotonie inépuisablement variée, ce niveau après ce bouleversement, ces enfers et ces paradis de l'immensité éternellement émus, cet infini, cet insondable, tout cela peut être dans un esprit, et alors cet esprit s'appelle génie. Et vous avez Échille, vous avez euh, Isaïe, vous avez Juvenal, vous avez Dante, vous avez Michel-Ange, vous avez Shakespeare, et c'est la même chose de regarder ces âmes ou de regarder l'océan. Donc, on, je pense qu'on peut se laisser facilement entraîner dans ce rythme hugolien, mais pour cette année, nous avions décidé de résister à l'élan hugolien. Et donc, c'est ce qui nous a entraîné vers la piste donc, du petit, du détail. Non, évidemment, pour nier la grandeur, hein, mais pour proposer une autre perspective, pour nous forcer à regarder de manière différente. Donc, je, je suis ravie que ce thème ait suscité tant d'intérêts et d'idées euh, différentes et que l'on s'apprête à parler pendant ces trois jours de, des sonnets, euh, de syllabes, de petites formes, de miniatures, de petites tailles, du presque rien, cher à Jean Kélévitch, de fragments et de microcosme, etc. Donc, euh, voilà, c'est notre perspective pour ces trois jours et je vous souhaite donc un excellent, une excellente, un excellent congrès. <laughs> voilà. And I'm going to say a few words in English. Um, so, welcome everyone. And I'm pleased on behalf of the board of the, the French Shakespeare Society to welcome you to our annual conference at the beautiful Fondation Dutch de la Meurthe. And uh, as I was saying in French, so, uh, uh, regarding this year's theme, Shakespeare in Focus, the Art of Small Things, the initial idea, I believe, was to counter Victor Hugo's romantic view of Shakespeare. You know, Shakespeare is for uh, Hugo, l'homme océan, the ocean man, uh, inducing visions of greatness. Um, so I will only read part of this text, which I'm not sure it, it, it translates well, but these angers and these appeasements, this all-in-one, this unexpected in the immutable, this vast prodigy of endlessly varied monotony, this level after this upheaval, these hells and these paradises of eternally moved immensity, this infinity, this unfathomable, all this can be in one mind, and then this mind is called genius, and you have Aeschylus, you have Isaiah, you have Juvenal, you have Dante, you have Michelangelo, you have Shakespeare, and it is the same to look at these souls as it is to look at the ocean. So, as I was saying, it's easy to get carried away in this uh, rhythm, but uh, for this year we chose to resist Victor Hugo, uh, and, and this led us to envisage the small things, the details, and Uh, as I said, you know, it's, the idea is not to, to deny greatness, but to offer another perspective, to force ourselves to look differently at our subject. And so I'm delighted that this theme has sparked, uh, you know, so much interest and different ideas and in that we are about to discuss sonnets, 
syllables, small forms, miniatures, smallness, the almost nothing fragments, microcosm over these three days. And so I wish you all an excellent conference. And uh, for this first panel, we turn the floor over to uh, our friend Ladan Yayesh, our professor at the University of Paris-Cité, if I'm not mistaken. And thank you very much, Ladan, for uh, sharing this uh, very first panel. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you uh, all for uh, this beautiful conference, all who participated in the uh, in the choice of this uh, um, this beautiful topic for the uh, for the conference. So it's a great uh, honor uh, to be chairing this first session, uh, which is going to be about letters and syllables, as Christine announced. I invite our three speakers to join us uh, for this first panel. Please, um, maybe Robin and Mister Robin, the PowerPoint. No, okay. your own good self. Uh, so while, uh, please, uh, so while our, our speakers uh, take their seats, um, it's my great pleasure to be announcing uh, Robert Stack as our first uh, speaker. Rob is a uh, Liverpool Research Fellow at the Shakespeare Institute uh, of Stratford of Panaven. Oh, pardon me. Goodness, technology again. Jinx by technology ever. That's the story of my life. Ah, it does work, yes, okay. So, in order for people not to lose anything on Rob's presentation, I will rewind a little bit uh, to say that it's my great pleasure to announce that our first speaker, uh, Rob Stack, who's a Liberty Research Fellow at the Shedford Institute of Stratford upon Avon and uh, Associate Senior Member of St. Anne's College, Oxford. Uh, his first book, Shakespeare Blanchard's An Alternative History, was published recently by Oxford University Press in 2022. Currently, Rob is working on his, on his second book project, Shakespeare's Work This Time, and he has definitely uh, played it anti Victor Hugo, and he's got to uh, have complied with the uh, challenge of our conference, already a huge choice of title, going for the shortest possible form, the syllable. Over to you, Rob. Merci. Hello. Merci, Madame Bobo Remarque, um, et un grand merci. Uh, um, aux, aux organisateurs de la conférence um, pour le travail uh, et pour leur accueil. Um, C'est un plaisir, comme toujours, comme toujours uh, d'être à Paris. Alors, on y va en anglais. <laughs> What could be smaller than the syllable? According to Charles Cairns and Eric Ramey in their charmingly titled Handbook of the Syllable from 2009, Syllable is the basic unit of linguistic rhythm, and arguably the smallest unit of that rhythm, too. Yet the small quality of the syllable is often the grounds for its critical negligence rather than its critical prestige. Even this conference is called the papers attending to Shakespeare up close or à la lue, mentions Ben Johnson's references to Shakespeare's verse lines but doesn't mention Shakespeare's syllables, smaller though they are than the verse lines they help to establish. And this makes sense, it's no wonder, since Shakespeare's lines do get mentioned again and again and again in the prefatory material to the first folio, in poems by Ben Jonson, by Hugh Holland, by Leonard Diggs, whereas Shakespeare's syllables receive no attention in the folio at all, I think, or in that prefatory material to the folio. In editorial practice, which is mostly what I'll be talking about today, the syllable has long been subordinated to the supposed demands of the verse line. We see this in the very prepositions of editorial language, whereby syllables are described as being in a verse line, as though the line is the already formed container into which syllables are placed, rather than the syllables being of the verse line in a constitutive reciprocity. And that distinction between syllables in a line and syllables of the line is something I'll return to throughout this talk. Such language, the language of syllables being in a verse line, allows syllables to be editorially swept into existence or swept out of existence. Thus, in Alexander Pope's 1725 edition of Shakespeare's works, the first item I think on your handouts, Pope changes a line from 1 Henry 4, you have not sorted, how comes it then, to you have not sorted, sir, how comes it then? 
Pope's edition of that word, sir, is a little napkin of poetic diction, as James Sutherland has put it. But the insertion of the word sir also enables the line to reach a neat 10 syllables, a sort of platonic pentameter. Metrical and social proprieties are in concert. Or to take a kindred example from our own end of the long editorial tradition, again, it's on your handout, in the New Oxford Shakespeare, the editors emend Macbeth's line in the folio text, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem, to which fate and metaphysic aid doth seem. Meaning in their notes, the word metaphysical be ametrical, because its suffix pushes the line one syllable beyond the pentameter's assumed envelope. So the syllable must go. These examples, among Legion others, evince an editorial consensus that regards the verse line as the ultimate and predominant unit of prosodic meaning and with it semantic meaning. As Anthony Eastope has observed, editors continue to follow an unwritten rule, a sort of gestalt theory that, quote, any line in a passage of iambic pentameter ought to become iambic pentameter. Sometimes supposed mislineation in quarto or folio texts is fingered as the rationale for regularizing verse lines into smoother iambic pentameter. More often, the elision or epenthesis of syllables, that is the deletion or addition of syllables, is carried out in order to maintain that 10 syllable pentameter. This can produce results of deathly dullness. Surely it's no accident that the acronym for regular iambic pentameter spells R-I-P. <laughs> These relentlessly regular verse lines can come to sound a bit like the theme tune to the Pink Panther, de dum 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 And that de dum de dumming down of verse can produce a monotony more than a regularity. It can obliterate variety or even ambiguity. Now, I've mentioned that this editorial tradition of metrical de dum de dumming down, with its interventionist insistence that the pentameter has to be syllabically regular, and that syllables can be sacrificed or supplied in the process, with syllables being treated as a sort of editorial stock in trade, I've mentioned that that tradition reaches back to at least the 18th century. But Pope wouldn't, I think, have regarded himself as privileging the larger verse line over the smaller syllable. In the preface to his edition of Shakespeare, he contended that it was the actors who assembled the folio, who were the original Procrustean influence on Shakespeare, with all their lopping or stretching an author to make him just fit for their stage. Those are Pope's words. Yet Pope's tinkering editorial practice shows him thinking of syllables existing in a verse line rather than their being of a verse line. His emendations often supply something akin to what Marina Talinskaya calls the pleonastic do, where the word do, or any other monosyllable for that matter, exists as mere emphasis or filler. There's little acknowledgement in Pope's edition of Shakespeare that a line can be nine, and 10 syllables, say, or 10 and 11 syllables at the same time through the imaginative supposition of syllabic elision and expansion or the denial of such things, through the conjecture of an actually pause or movement, or through the listener's willingness to contest the line status as the preeminent unit of sense to give more credit to the syllable or syllables. This sort of prosodic ambiguity can crowd the air with meanings only half spoken, as George Wright has written, perhaps especially in a drama. It also hints at what might happen if we, as critics and or as theatre practitioners, think less of the verse line and more of the metrical items that interactionally comprise it, the syllable, syllables. The Pope does an injustice, not only to the variety and sometime undecidability of Shakespeare's versification, but to the pronounced syllabic ambiguity of the 16th and 17th centuries. In part, I think this is because he needs Shakespeare's words to have an immutable syllabic length such that he can fit them in the verse line or take them out accordingly. By contrast, for readers of the 16th and 17th centuries, words often shuffled between being monosyllabic and disyllabic, famous tree today. Words like prayer or being or heaven 
became, in Alfred Lord Tennyson's gorgeous phrase, neither monosyllabic nor disyllabic, but a dreamy child of the two. And some of those words still are, right? We might say um, prayer is two syllables. We might say it's one syllable, depending on, on how we hear it or speak it. So as Peter Holland has set out, Coriolanus's name seems to shift in syllabic size in Shakespeare's play. Is Martius two syllables? Or is it three, Martius? Is Coriolanus four syllables? Or is it five? His name syllabically slips and slides, vulnerably protean in the process. He risks becoming, in the words of the play itself, a kind of nothing, titleless. In Ben Jonson's play, The New Inn, the characters Fly and Peck deal with this question of syllabic ambiguity head on. They argue about how many syllables they each find in the word foundered. Is it two or is it three? Founderid, I suppose. The argument turns in part on the poverty of our language for syllables. They're so often the foundering foundations of speech. Unlike the putatively solid foundations of the verse line, Syllables wriggle loose of our understanding. We're reduced to, to tapping out the syllables of words with our fingers to get a better sense, though it's only ever a sense, of a word's full magnitude. Futile attempt to bring the syllable into the surer world of the haptic, as though the existence of matter must be registered in matter itself. Like the word stuff, which is a verb of enlargement but a noun of diminution, Syllables can grow or shrink depending on their observer or hearer or place in various grammatical and metrical orders. However acoustically small, these questions of syllables and their status are not trivial. The 17th century preacher, Thomas Adams, noted how one seemingly superfluous syllable can change the nature of a word completely, as when turning amorem into amarorem, love, into bitterness. In John Webster's The White Devil, Montecelso grieves how brittle evidences of law can forfeit all a wretched man's estate for leaving out one syllable. There is therefore something prosodically parsimonious about Pope's editorial practice concerning the syllable. It ignores some of the most interesting and important questions raised by syllabic ambiguities in a verse line. For example, if a word becomes comes longer, gains in metrical substance by gaining in spoken syllables, does it become more substantial? And how? That is, do we say with Dante in De Bulgaria Eloquentia, De Bulgaria Eloquentia, whenever things of value are magnified, their value itself is magnified also? And if so, how do we handle the apparently four-syllabled rather than three-syllabled speakings of the words ambitious and honorable? in Mark Antony's address to the plebeians in Julius Caesar. There, that stretch in the syllabics of the words is intended almost to snap them, put them under severe ironical strain. Pope risks becoming the whipping boy of this paper, which would be unfair. He was, after all, operating within a much longer tradition of editorial thinking or not thinking about syllables. In the 1550s, Richard Topple notoriously revised Thomas Wyatt's verse lines by stripping them of syllables. He edited 21 lines of Wyatt's satires to regularize the number of syllables, restricting them from 11 syllables to a proper pentameterly 10 syllables. And in the end, only two of the 306 lines in the satires remain with more than 10 syllables. Sometimes, as H.A. Mason has recognized, quote, Tottle's metrical experiments are so crude that by excising a low or an intrusive that, we can recover the line the editors had before them. But Tottle's editing was so comprehensive as to be ultimately quite inconspicuous. And Pope's syllabic modifications in the service of the line are of a piece with the 1623 folio a volume that Pope otherwise wanted to disdain. So let's think about some metrical interventions in the folio text of Othello, and this is the last uh, item, or couple of items on your handouts. We don't know what kind of text the compositors of the folio relied upon when they came to set the play. 
Textual scholars have variously argued that the quarto and folio versions of the play are set from different manuscripts, or the same manuscript misconstrued, or that the folio relies on the quarto to some extent, or even that the quarto text relies on the folio text. And if the folio does draw on the quarto text in certain, in, the quarto text in certain respects, as seems pretty likely, then its compositors frequently shorten Desdemona's name. And they seemingly do this, I think, to fit the lines in which it appears. By doing so, they refuse the possibility that Desdemona's name composes rather than enters the verse line. Again, it's that distinction between syllables being something you put in to a verse line or take out of them, and syllables as being as fundamentally comprising and constituting the verse line, so they can't be taken out and, and put in at will, at least not without serious, I think, consequence. Even if we accept the Popian editorial view that syllables should be thought of as in, not of a line, the decisions made by the folio's compositors, I think, mute the expressive effect a name can have or a word can have when it seems almost to object to its place or length in a verse line. So let's take a look. When Othello accuses Desdemona of being false in the quarto, first item, of the, the final diptych, as it were, on your handout, the line shivers in protest. Desdemona says, to whom, my lord, with whom, how am I false? The fellow replies, oh, Desdemona, away, away, away. Now let's look at the folio, to whom, my lord, with whom, how am I false? Are Desdemon, away, away, away. The A at the end of Desdemona's name in the quarto provokes a slight tremor in Othello's verse, before an iambic rhythm continues through the second syllable of away. The folio text replaces this with a more unbothered, uninterrupted meter. It treats Desdemona's name to what the rhetorician Henry Peacham called apocope, the taking away of a letter or a syllable from the ends of a word. It soothes the quarto's brief moment of metrical disturbance. Of course, that distinction between the quarto's Desdemona and the folio's Desdemon might just be an accident of handwriting. Perhaps the final letter of her name wasn't altogether clear at this point and others in the manuscript. But in metrical terms, the folio is slightly neater overall. There's some debate among scholars about which of the two texts sports a higher degree of mislineation, but there are certainly a greater number of half lines in the quarto. Most of the quarto speeches end with a half line, and there are dozens in the middle of speeches too. Of the nine lines that only appear in the quarto text, about half could reasonably be described, I think, as being short of pentameter. And that's generally not true of the additional lines in the folio text. In his 1958 edition of Othello, M.R. Ridley located two instances of the folio adjusting quarto lines to the regulation 10 syllables, as he put it. And he argued more widely that whoever prepared the copy for folio disliked metrical irregularities. And the contraction of Desdemona's name in the folio is unlikely to be the result of a straightforward compositorial fondness for abbreviation. The quarto has substantially more contracted word forms than the folio. The folio's sometimes truncation of Desdemona's name seems then to be part of a broader commitment to syllabic regularity the evenness of the verse line. It's not only in its prefatory material then that the folio privileges the line above the syllable. In the quarto, Othello sounds the full length of Desdemona's name, so that we hear that prolonged moan within Desdemona. I think it's absent from the folio's Desdemon. I mean, I suppose it can be pronounced Desdemon, but it still loses that reverberation that you get through the final A. And this pairs back one of the play's acoustic attitudes or refrains, as Joel Feynman called them. The manner in which the shared O's of Othello, his name gets sonically bounded by those sounds of woe, uh, and indeed the O's that he shares in his name with Desdemona, the way in which they become part of the play's verbal atmosphere of moans, and they, they share in other characters' O-filled names, Brabantio, Gratiano, Lodovigo, Cassio, Iago, Rodrigo, Montano. Folio's Desdemon, rather than the Quarto's Desdemona, 
syllabically reduces Shakespeare's character, her etymological and literary origin, the desdemon, the ill-fated one of Giraldi Cinthio's Hecatomitha of 1565. So the folio is in this respect even more papal than Pope in their relatively uncompromising quest for metrical tidiness, Folio's editors or compositors end up compromising Desdemona. They give her a bad name. I'll conclude by sketching an alternative tradition. Another early modern approach to the syllable, one that values the syllable as foundational, if also as somewhat or sometimes fickle. In much atomistic thought of the 16th and 17th centuries, scholars and natural philosophers often conceived of the syllable as an atom and of the atom as a syllable, not only due to its small size, but also due to its fundamental importance. Lucretius, whose De Rero Natura is the locus classicus here, has repeatedly written of the atom in terms of elementa, a word which could mean either physical or linguistic elements, the latter specifically including letters and syllables. Lucretius's early modern readers paid appropriately close attention to his syllables, as Ada Palmer has discussed in her book, Reading Lucretius in the Renaissance. She finds all these examples of Renaissance readers of Lucretius um, annotating Lucretius's own scansion, as it were. One of Lucretius's most celebrated readers, Lucy Hutchinson, wrote of numbering the syllables of her translation of, Lucre of Lucretius by the threads of the canvas she wrought in while weaving, so that the elementa of her poetry found material kinship in the elementa of the fabric she was weaving. This brief concluding glimpse of an alternative versification in which the syllable lies at the base of all all that the line can achieve might point the way to an alternative mode of reading and editing. One that doesn't make syllables into merely fungible items that can be exchanged, added, subtracted at editorial will, but that pictures the verse line as composed, almost atom-like, of vital individual elements, elementa, if you will, that lend a living mobility to the line. This alternative mode of reading and writing and editing syllables could even be, in the words of this conference's subtitle, an art of small things. Thank you for listening. Your love for this favor and excellent beginning to our um, to our conference. Uh, I suggest we keep the uh, questions for the end after the uh, the, the two talks. Um, yes. So let me uh, introduce our second speaker on this panel. Then also this one. With the second year PhD students at Sobel and Ben on the music production. Um, the research is focused on words on stage and the work of the language in Shakespeare's early comedies. Uh, Clemence teaches English at the Lycée Guimolé in Arras, and she has also for several years collaborated with Lydian Gadetancha and Marianne Martine on a digital humanities project on Georgian cities housed by Sorbonne University. Um, today she's going to talk to us about Anglo Saxon microcosm versus Latin mathematicism, which is first um, uh, defense of policy in policy levels in last day response. Over to you, Clemence. Thank you very much. So, as the great feast of languages, Act 5, Scene 1, Love's Labors Lost testifies to what Kira Elam has called the period's, quote, of subcultivation of linguistic forms, end of quote, in Shakespeare's universal discourse. The play celebrates the power of naming by turning words into its main protagonist. This presentation proposes more precisely to focus on the smallest and most primitive building block of language after the sound, the monosyllabic word in this early Shakespearean comedy where Longueville reminds us that vows are but breath and breath of vapor is. In this line where he uses almost exclusively monosyllabic words, he emphasizes the void, inconsistency and vanity of oral speech, as well as the more, more natural constituent related to speech, air, breath, vapor, and more particularly in the case of the monosyllable, the voicing out of one syllable 
in a single breath of air. This also allows him to comment upon theater as a genre firstly and essentially practiced orally and not meant for printing, as Andrew Gurr reminds it in the Shakespearean stage. Consequently, I propose to study the intricate conflict at the core of the use of monosyllables. Monosyllables are either deemed incompatible and inadequate because of their apoetic nature. They are said to be unsophisticated and uneloquent because too small to express the complexity of new discoveries in science and geography. Or those of poetry too remote as well from the deemed excellent Latinate uh, phraseology. In the middle of the 20th century, Richard Foster Jones claimed that, quote, a pride in the Germanic element of the language produced a change in the attitude toward monosyllables in the 16th century, that there was a great number of them in the English tongue and that their comprise in large part the Saxon element was known to the period. He also refers to monosyllable as the Germanic element of language or Saxon component of the native tongue in the trial of the English language, uh, which stands as a celebration, defense, and illustration of the vernacular English language. I shall add that throughout this paper, um, I'm using the term Anglo-Saxon as a synonym with Saxon, English, or Germanic in the same linguistic perspective as Foster Jones. In the historical context of the Inkhorn controversy, when the dominant linguistic pattern uh, to expand vocabulary was to derive it mostly from Latin language, a friend of purists promoted the monosyllables as the possibility of abundant meanings through a brief and short linguistic signs, rejecting partly or completely foreign words. To name but a few early modern linguists, George Putnam uh, vastly talks about the excellency of the monosyllables in relation, um, uh, very common in Anglo-Saxon that he also relates to Anglo-Norman in the art of English poesy. Uh, Ralph Lever approved of the monosyllables because uh, they lend themselves uh, readily to his plan of augmenting the English vocabulary exposed in the art of reason, uh, rightly termed re requirement. Uh, for instance, he coined compounds combining two monosyllables to avoid Latin rooted terms, such as ensays for conclusion, forsays for premises, say what for definition, woodcraft for logic, and yesay for affirmation. Yet in the 16th century, as well as in the next, the attitude toward monosyllables was frequently crit crit critical, sorry, particularly with respect to poetry. Even when orthoepists such as William Camden argue in favor of English and its monosyllabic term, it's just to say that they are unfitting for verses and measure in his remains concerning Britain in 1605. Um, as for George Chapman in the last um, uh, quote in the slide, he is praising the monosyllable that fits poeticism. With this context in mind, I would now like to argue that Love's Labour's Lost constitutes the battle of syllables or monosyllables, which stands as a reconfiguration of Shakespeare's art comica, whose aim is to reach many types of audiences. So the linguistic debate of the early modern era that I have just sketched out is summed up in Act 5, Scene 2, with the metaphor of language as a self-reflexive fabric and the difficulty to use elaborate and long sentences borrowed mostly from Latinate phraseology. Baron indeed expresses a skepticism towards tafta phrases, silken terms precise, prepied hyperboles, prusaffectation, figure sedantico, and vows instead to woo in simple yeas and noes, that is a more rustic, shorter syllabic and practical vocabulary coming from German. Rusticiers, and honest cursey notes. Olofernes, the educated pedant and representative of the Latin language of the play, offers a sort of re-evaluation of English monosyllables through the prism of Latin in the following passage, where he questioned the pronunciation of the following monosyllables, focusing on the analysis of doubt and debt. So in this extract, in a cue which is teeming with Latin neologisms as well as Latin sentences, Olofernes insists on the relation between Latin etymology and pronunciation. Doing so, he first runs counter also such as John Hart, 
one of the first spelling reformers who thought that to create a purer form of English, what he calls English English, one should get rid of the remaining unpronounced letters in the words it was borrowed from in favor monosyllables. Here doubt is spelled Z-O-U-B-T when B is normally not pronounced and becomes a vestige of the Latin root dubitare, as in debt, spelled D-E-B-T, in which the B is a remain of the term debitum. Not pronouncing the letter B constitutes a failure for our pedant, as we understand that he is a supporter of Latin etymological spelling against phonetic spelling. Yet, what is here even more interesting is the reason why he chooses to do so. It is important to recall that doubt and debt were artificially spelled D-E-B-T and D-O-U-B-T at the time, and conserving the letter B was a way to underline the direct influence of Latin on English and the natural relation between both languages when actually doubt and debt were borrowed from French uh, and written without the letter B according to the Oxford English Dictionary. While Olofoni smells false Latin commenting upon the other characters' use of language, he is the one revising the spelling of words to reclaim Latin as the primary cultural heritage of, of English and to give more legitimacy to the English monosyllables he uses. The other major point within the linguistic debate of the play is for the character to find the most sweet as well as apt terms. So those two terms appear as Act 1, Scene 2 and Act 5, Scene 1 to refer to reality. In fact, the discussion Act 5, Scene 1, between Armado and Olofernes is revealing. The topic of their conversations revolves around the expression, the posteriors of this day, to refer to the more Germanic sounding compound, afternoon. Olofernes analyzes the expression used by Armado, saying that the posterior of the day is liable, congruent, and measurable for the afternoon. So Olofernes is first struck by the perfect parallelism between exterior and afternoon, three syllables each. Then he switches progressively to monosyllabic terms. The word is well called, choice, sweet, and apt. The choice of the term apt is particularly interesting because it covers both the ideas of having the right measure, but also of being appropriate to express ideas and paves the way for the actual battle between the Latin poster ior and the English after noon and leads us to consider the monosyllable noon contained in afternoon progressively displaying the bogey undertone of the dialogue dealing with sodomy, expression, foul smell, and sex. So while posterior is a fully Latin term, the English version of the word is made of the prefix after, and the monosyllabic root noon itself a hybrid linguistic form. Indeed, noon is the perfect combination of Germanic language and Latin. It is a borrowing from the Germanic language through the Latin nona. So noon comes from nona hora, which was the end of a day of work in Rome uh, around 3 p.m. And it was also, also the time when the prostitutes called nonaria, which means literally the women of the ninth hour, uh, would be able to start working. Um, Shakespeare, here um, I argue that Shakespeare is revising etymology to achieve perfect correspondence between Latin and English. So maybe we can rewrite posteri or H O R, or being the abbreviation of orlogi, the constellation of the clock, or simply aura. In a second step, we can also see a sort of elaborate bilingual quibble through combination of Latin and English, creating a body joke, posteri hor. Um, and um, uh, indeed, progressively, the body joke uh, materializes uh, in the sound as, a monosyllable from Germanic origin directly related to posteriors. Uh, which pervades the discussion, it is cleverly hidden in other words. Uh, sure is repeated three times, pass five times, assistance twice. Even ostentation and grace could have been pronounced in such ways as for the word ass to be heard. And Armado opens the discussion by calling Olofernes artsman, uh, 
uh, playing on the homophony between art and arts, but also on the actual word, the Latin word, A-R-S, meaning art, and um, uh, bringing two opposite ideas together. Um, the lexical field of the passage is also quite transparent. It's about pleasure, mountain, the homophone of mountain, excrement, and the word cult, which means selected, chosen, but comes from the French cul and defined by Codrave as an arse, bum, tail, no can draw, fondament. The very presence of the plural form of the word posteriors, employed by um, Armado, makes it clear that Armado had in mind the crude pun, as the plural form is an, e is an early use, first recorded in 1605, and the plural only applied when the meaning of posterior was buttocks. Another occurrence by Harrington appears before, in 1594, confirming this analysis because it mixed uh, two types of endings, the so Latin ending orum uh, of the plural genitive and the English s of the plural. Uh, I would also suggest that there is a third step in which the reinvention of the term posteri or works on an even bigger scale and contaminates later the show the nine were uh, worthy or nine horties, nonaria, as the reference to the number nine is lost when you switch from afternoon to posterior, Shakespeare reinstills it later, creating a show with nine people, nine horses. And you have a body subtext of comedy in the show of the nine horses where Ajax be become a close tool or privy and a uh, part is used uh, for um, as a metaphor of playing a role and also as male genitalia and so on and so forth. Um, so therefore Shakespeare keeps on exploiting the full poetic potential of both languages, Germanic as well as Latin, to detail body references and turn heroic figures into lowborn and primitive characters through the use of syllables. Uh, finally, Shakespeare nurtured the intricacy of monosyllables through paradoxes and reversals, um, and proves that short terms and sounds from Anglo-Saxon and Germanic origin can be as poetic as Latin ones. That is, to my sense, also the reason why he chooses to use a secondary and monosyllable name, full like dull, a key character, to highlight the full potentiality of monosyllables and embody the essence of witty comedy. In Act 4, Scene 2, Olofernes and Nathaniel appear on stage for the first time, and they encounter dull. This constitutes quite a clash of cultures, as Nathaniel and Oliphonis are talking about the hunting game that happened before with the princess, they comment extensively upon the deer she killed. So most of the time, and here it is the case, Oliphonis does what we could call live translation, uh, associating often uh, disyllabic or plurisyllabic uh, Latin terms with English Germanic rooted monosyllables, so, for instance, here he uses Kylo, three syllables, and Sky, one, Sanguis, two, in blood, two monosyllables, Terra, two, Soil, Land, Earth, three monosyllables, and then you have other significant examples below. So, in this scene, while uh, complementing his use of epithets sweetly varied, like scholar at the least, Nathaniel, who wants Holofernes to be precise, showing that regardless of the presence of excellent Latin words and detailed synonymy is achieving confusion rather than clarity, he corrects him by telling him it was not a deer that the prince killed, but a buck, a five-year-old male deer. Holofernes uh, answers naturally with a Latin phrase, out the door, which means I do not believe it. Hearing their conversation, Dull answers, twas not uh, out credo, uh, glossed as old grado in contemporary edition, twas a cricket, a cricket being a buck in its second year. While Nathaniel and Oliphernes interpret his answer as a mistake, they highlight his lack of education and his ignorance of the Latin language, calling him monster ignorance. Using a very hyperbolic and copious language of synonymy, undressed and polished and educated and pruned and trained, rather unlettered or rather rest and confirmed fashion, uh, they compare him to an animal. He is only an animal, only sensible in the dirty parts. 
Yet, Dirt Terror becomes the starting point of a creative process. First, though human or former, Dirt, in fact, outwits Nath Nathaniel and Olafonis in precision and in his knowledge of technical vocabulary regarding hunting. Second, he becomes a useful representative of the spectators who would not all be educated enough to understand Latin and achieve the possibility of including a more popular public in the acting watching process. Finally, he proved that his poetic and um, facetious coinage is not less creative and is actually Shakespeare using uh, parakesis uh, associated with a sort of Monde Green, so an auditory hallucination. As Michael Fountain explains in funny words in plotting comedy, parakesis come from the Greek parakema, meaning jingo, near echo, and gets its name from the echo-like similarity of sounds in words of different origins. It was also a practice used by Plotus and Terence to translate, transfer, and transpose the Greek jokes from Menander into the Latin version. This way, Dull bridges the gap between the Latin language and Germanic monosyllabic English, creating actual correspondence between both languages through transcription of the Latin phonemes and dithyllabic words into English monosyllables, which fit the conversation and reveal, as well as his ignorance of Latin, his knowledge of hunting and animal species. More than that, it is also a way of celebrating English, because the language that needs to be really mastered here to understand the joke is the vulgar language, making comedy available to all attendees. The full liberation of language and words takes place when it becomes an autonomous system, and when the text ends on pure phonics, substance, to wit, to who. So wit and who, uh, wooing being the two essential constituents of comedy. So the, the Latin out credo gives birth to English monosyllable, old grado and pricket paves the way for pricket. Monosyllables find their way back to a common point shared both by Latin and English in relation to drama, to, to the breath, to the voice and to the primitive and basic idea of sound as the play ends on the sounds of birds through the song of the cuckoo and the howl, being at the crossroads of oral and written culture, a sort of comic translation of an oral equivalent. Finally, I will argue that this minimalist linguistic element could only be fully defended on stage for plays themselves were, as Gur reminds us, a minor literary genre. They were, quote, as ephemeral as the sounds to, through which they came to life, end of quote, in the Shakespearean stage, which takes. Very much. Just understood the No. Ah, thank you. Pardon? Yes. <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, to, uh, to and we will now move on to our third speaker on this panel, Lenisia Sanzanetti, who is a uh, senior lecturer in English uh, translation studies at the University of California. That is the research uh, bears on the reception of classical and continental texts in England, language learning, multilingualism, and translation. The research project on translation and polyglossy in learning modern England was found, funded by a five year grant uh, from the Institute University of Wisconsin, which just finished. Um, she is still general editor of the Polyglot Encounters in the Modern Britain series with Breville's publishers. And with you. Indeed. Something <laughs> else. Uh, and she has also uh, co-edited uh, within this series a uh, volume like this, with Renny Goodman on language commonality and literary communities in Animal in England in 2022. And uh, today uh, she uh, makes me face a uh, challenge uh, to pronounce her title since she's inviting us to uh, look at the uh, special question. Why are Shakespeare's sonnets double N or not sonnets single N? Over to you. Thank you very much. So, 
Yes. Um, beyond the egotistic pleasure of having part of my last name on basically every slide of this presentation, <laughs> my interest in the spelling of the word sonnet stems from two recent developments, one in my own research and one in the study of early modern poetic works. Over the past few years, studying literary polyglossia, I've become more and more sensitive to issues of spelling, and in particular phonetic spelling, as very mean. Recent work on the sonnet, from the point of view of form, by my distinguished co-panelist Robert Stag Amita, and by my good friend Rémi Vuillemin, and also a distinguished colleague at the Maison Page, has also been an incentive to focus on formal features, in my case, not so much of the poems as of the word itself. Just as the early modern English sonnet came in several shapes and sizes, the term had various terms. The word sonnet um, was borrowed through a complex process in which Italian and French mixed and merged. Sonnet 1N was already in use in medieval England, an Anglo Norman borrowing from Old French sonnet, meaning a song which could be spelt with one or two N's in Middle French. When early modern English borrowed the Italian word sonetto by La French to refer to the poetical poem made of 14 lines and associated with Petrov and his followers, the word was printed with various spellings before the variant with two ends became dominant. Ultimately, both sonnet one end meaning one end meaning song and sonnet with two ends meaning a 14 line poem derived from the same Latin etymon sonitus, meaning sound, but they're called sound. While variations in spelling between sonnet 1n and sonnet 2n's could just reflect the unstandardized state of early modern English spelling, I would like to consider the possibility that the distribution among these various forms might be meaningful. I will thus treat the word sonnet as a lexical palimpsest, a condensed version of the history of English borrowings from continental Romance languages, asking what it tells us about the transnational character of English literature in the early modern period. My guiding hypotheses in this inquiry are that spelling could have a semantic input in helping to define the form as a genre closer to song or as a kind of poem with a codified form. A phonological value, highlighting issues of vowel length and stress shift, and cultural connotations evoking Italian or French poetry, or nativizing the sonnet as an English form. Lastly, bearing in mind that spelling was not always authorial and was considered the printer's responsibility, I acknowledge the possibilities suggested by Susan Gossett. What if the printer went to lunch? <laughs> Considering the immensely vast potential corpus and the limited time for this presentation, I cannot hope to offer a complete survey, so I will focus on a few specific cases, starting with the first mentions of the term in translations and adaptations of continental poems, before turning to Shakespeare's plays and poems as printed texts and as oral discourses. The Italian editions of Pet what? of Petrarch Sansoniere, sorry, literally song book, referred to his poems as Sonetti e Canzoni, as we can see here, and the 1581 Basel edition of the concrete works, which, as you know from Remy's presentation last year, was very influential in the reception of Petrarch in late Tudor and early Stuart England introduced each sonnet with the mentioned sonetto, 1M, followed by a number, the 1M spelling being standard in Italian. Meanwhile, in France, the situation was less clear cut. In the 1555 translation of Petrarch's words, sonnet is spelled with two Ns in the printed text, but one N in a manuscript note um, in the margin. If we look at Pierre de Amour in their 1553 edition, which contains detailed commentary by Le Marc Antoine de Muret, we can see that sonnet is always spelled with one M, except in one of Muret's commentaries and in a running title in the end. In the 1560 and, uh, uh, and 1571 Mascarade, sonnet is likewise, so they, is likewise spelled with one M. But in Joachim du Bellet's works, the term is spelled with two S, as it is in Thomas Eliade's Arhoetique. 
Turning to England, in the translation of Petrarch's Triomphi, published in 1555, the poems from his canzoniere are called sonnets, with two ends, when they're referred to in the dedication, so many a sweet song. But the translation of the Triumph of Death has mentions of sonnets with one N, which are not in the original to develop and gloss the verb badly to sing. Lunga stella cantai becomes many a sonnet, and ne hai cantato in molte parti becomes many a sweet sonnet. Similarly, the phrase poemata canerent from Horace's Art of Poetry was English by Thomas Grant as sonnet to sing, this time with two N's, whereas in the epistles and satires, sonnet was spelled with one N. I think this creates a form of ambiguity as to the meaning of sonnet, the 14 line poem, and a sort of song. George Gascoigne's definition, sorry, um, features a tantalizing distribution between the one and spelling for oral poetry, thank you very much, and the two and spelling for the general, oh, that's much better, for the general label, which collapses itself in its restrictive definition. Then I have you sonnets, two ends. Some think that all, some think that all poems being short may be called sonnets, one end, as indeed it is a diminutive word derived of sonare, but yet I can best allow to call those sonnets one end, which are of 14 lines, every line containing 10 syllables. I still need to check whether the distribution between one N and two end forms in the several works collected in the posies corresponds to Italian versus French references, which it seems to do at first sight. George Putnam prefers the one end spelling in his Art of English Poesy, which may be due to his referring to the sonnet's Italian origins and reproducing translations of Petrarch by Thomas Wyatt, or identifying it with oral forms of poetry, odes, songs, ballads, etc. In Philip Sidney's Defense of Poesy, printed by Thomas Creed for William Ponsonby, the word sonnet is spelled with one N, as you can see, but in the Apology of Poetry, printed by James Robert Henry Oney, it is with two Ns. Could it reflect two tendencies among printers and publishers, one for foreignizing one N, and one for nativizing two Ns, or maybe one for highlighting the Italian origin, and the other one the French mediation? Due to this slide, the title of the famous 1557 sonnet collection now known as Totals and Seveny becomes ambiguous. In the first edition, as you can see, it was spelled Tongues and Sonnets, N E double T E S, but the spelling is closer to both the Italian sonetto, 1N, and to the Anglo Norman sonnet, 1N2. But in the 1585 edition, First one not to have been printed by Richard Tuttle, sonnet is spelled with a double N. This spelling could, at least that was my initial impression, could indicate a stress shift testifying to the assimilation of the word. From the French and Italian stress pattern on the second syllable, sonnet and sonetto, the stress has moved further away from the last syllable, thus becoming more English in sound as the form was being nativized in English poetry. The phrase songs and sonnets seems to have become a sort of binomial with sonnet spelled with one N, as you can see in these examples. But over the same period of time, the variant songs and sonnets with two Ns can also be found which blurs the semantic value of spelling. Sonnet is found spelled with two Ns in context which explicitly have to do with singing, as with the debate over liturgy in the vernacular that is at the core of the great controversy of the mid to late 1560s. Thomas Stapleton tries to undermine Bishop Jewell's arguments that in the primitive church there were songs in local vernaculars, by using the binomial in a duality way, that Master Jewel would then prove the church service by singing of songs and sonnets. In his Apology of Poetry, Sidney mentions the binomial in a similarly religious context, only to lament that singing is applied to lowly topics in English poetry. 
binomial reaches across all types of discourses within and without the strictly literary ambits. In the translation of Jacques Ferrand's Traité de l'essence et guérison de l'amour, which what's appeared as sonnet lassif in the French version with one N, has become lascivious songs and sonnets, two Ns in English. So this is the motley background against which the spelling of the word sonnet in Shakespeare's works stand out as surprisingly consistent. The most visually striking example of this consistency is the well-known title page of Shakespeare's sonnets, first published in 1609. In the earlier uh, Passionate Pilgrim, which, as you know, is only partly by Shakespeare, an internal title page identifies a section as sonnets to sundry notes of music. And within the 1609 volume, um, the section entitled The Lover's Complaint contains a mention of the word sonnet, also with two ends. Now I'm feeling very self-conscious after Bob's paper about my um, scanning of lines in Shakespeare, telling to hear I am the contaminated everywhere. But anyway, I'll go ahead. If we scan this rhyming couplet as regular iambic pentameters, sonnet is stressed on the first syllable, contrary to its French and Italian cognates. If we look for occurrences of the word sonnet with one N in non Shakespearean poems, the evidence is scant, and I need to do some more research. But my initial intuition that differences in spelling might have entailed differences in stress not seem to be supported by the few examples that I have found. In Shakespeare's dramatic canon, all occurrences of the term are also spelled with two ends, both in quarto publications and in the 1623 folio edition. If we take them in chronological order, Love's Lady's Lost comes first with a quarto edition in 1598. So the first um, Occurrences are found in prose passages, as with our Maddow's famous claim, I shall turn sonnet, and two are in stage directions, clearly identifying the poems that are read by the men of the bar as sonnets, although technically only Longueville's text fits the formal description of a 14-line poem with three quatrains and a final rhyming couplet. Dumaine's On a Day, a Lack the Day, which is reproduced in the sonnets section of the 59 Passion of Pilgrim is not. With its 10 rhyming couplets of heptasyllables and its catalectic tropic rhythm, it is closer to an anacreontic song. What seems to matter in the play is the artificiality associated with the term sonnet, sonnet as noted by Guillaume Coetelien about a wide corpus of plays in his study of sonnet mongers on the early modern English stage. When the king confronts Dumaine and Longueville, he mocks their poetic outburst in a speech that is itself in rhyming couplets. You do not love Maria, Longueville did never sonnet for her sake compel. Verone then reveals that the king himself has penned blog poems for the princess of France. You will not be perjured to the hateful thing, touch not but minstrels like of sonneting. In both cases, the lines scan regularly, but the choriambic at the beginning of the um, last line, if sonnet and sonneting are stressed on the first syllable. In Much Ado About Nothing, similar connotations are associated with sonnet writing, and the passage in verse that contains the word sonnet spells with two ends. Once again, it scans as regular iambic pentameter if sonnet is stressed on the first syllable. The pieces of paper on which the sonnets are written are held up by Hero and Claudio as proof of Beatrice and Benedict's mutual infatuation. In a scene from The Merry Waves of Windsor that is not in the 1602 quarto version, Slender declares, I think rather than 40 shillings, I have my book of songs and sonnets here. While this is another interesting instance of the representation of sonnets as written poetry, what I find even more interesting is the spelling of sonnets paired with songs. We are back full circle where we started songs and sonnets as in the original title of Total's Miscellany, but in the meantime, the bookish element of the two N spelling seems to have prevailed over the spoken element associated with the one N spelling. By comparison, 
Ben Johnson's plays show differences in the spelling of sonnet between the quarto versions published individually and the complete works. In Protester, Luskus begs Ovid to renounce poetry and focus on his law studies instead. Away with your songs and sonnets, and on with your gown and cap. In the case is altered, Onion makes a similar plea to Juniper. No more of thy songs and sonnets, of thy hakims and madrigals. Thou singest, but I'll sigh. Here the verb sing seems to point to oral poetry, poems that are indeed akin to songs, hymns, and madrigals. In the 1616 works in which the case is altered is not produced, sonnet in Poe Tester is spelled with two M's. So if the Johnsonians in the room <laughs> have suggestions as to whether this change reflects Johnson's authorial investment in the publication of the 1616 folio or not, I would be most grateful. In the quarto version of Every Man in His Humor, which is anterior, Sonnet is spelled with two ends. So is it to insist on the writing process rather than the delivery? Then do I no more but take your pen and paper presently and write you your house for or your dozen of sonnets. City. In the 16th folio, Matteo has become Matthew and Wright has become Overflow. Is it because writing sonnets was not a sufficiently ridiculous trait in itself? for the character to appear as a lovable girl. To conclude, have I, Polonius-like, been trying to find method where there was only spelling madness? In the oral and typographic story of the word sonnet, can we read and hear an evolution or conflict or distribution between poetry as sound and poetry as printed text? And are there positive or negative connotations associated with either and with the languages and countries from and through which the sonnet as a poetic form was imported and adapted into English? Question mark. It is tempting to believe that coherence of spelling in Shakespeare's works is due to his use of sonnets to refer to printed love poetry, which is mocked in the plays, as opposed to oral poetry. But then what about Shakespeare's own sonnets? Who chose the spelling and on what grounds? To make it a clearly English form? It is also tempting to believe that Shakespeare's works played a part in defining the form and standardizing its spelling. But we cannot extrapolate so much from the scant evidence I have been able to deal with. Much more remains to be done and we must be wary of hasty generalizations. The one end spelling and the two end spelling may have carried some meaning, sort of song, as opposed to a 14 line poem, but it is difficult to find evidence of a difference in pronunciation, so that I end up wondering if it had an oral history at all, outside of theater stages, on which it seems to have been pronounced unambiguously with the stress on the first syllable. Of course, I would be grateful for suggestions of counterexamples. What I think I can conclude more or less safely is that just as the form or genre has a European history, so the word sonnet needs to be discussed from a European perspective in dialogue with French and Italian mostly. I also hope I have managed to show how interesting it can be to follow a word in its occurrences um, in context across genres, beyond just strictly defined literary ambits to reach discussions about religion and even medicine. Considering the moral connotations associated with the word in some instances, it could be rewarding to investigate sermons, maybe, and to compare moral manuscripts and printed texts in more detail, and also to look at how sonetto in Italian was spelled in English poetry. But for now, sonetto is your attention. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much for being here on this uh, 
<laughs> but then I, I have a question. Can I borrow the pen at the end? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, good. Thanks. That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You had a question. Thank you. Um, thank you to all the speakers. That's the most fun I've had in a very long time. Yeah, it's a truly really way to start our gathering. So thank you for three wonderful papers. Um, my question is specifically for, for Robert. Um, I, so I come from South Africa, uh, where a handful of actors, maybe a dozen or so, uh, who perform Shakespeare, love to talk about their time at the RSC with Cicely Berry. Yeah. And time and time again, they will always say, trust the I am. Yeah. Yeah. Cicely taught us, trust the I am. Um, so, so it might be that there's a kind of decolonizing impetus behind the question, but even within the English tradition, or maybe even we could simply say within the kind of British theatrical performance context, what are the implications of your paper for performance and for actors? Um, is it an opportunity to deprioritize and, and the mastering thereof as a kind of necessary component of actor training? or a, a hurdle that you have to overcome, or a technique you must master. Um, so that's maybe a, a question kind of from within an English tradition. But then a second question, if I may, is what are the implications for uh, translators and translation? Because uh, it always seems that the, the sort of the question of whether or not one should attempt to convey something like an equivalent meter in, the, in let's call it the target language, um, should weigh it all on the, on the translator's mind. And I'm inclined to to say that the, the points that you've made about uh, syllables being constitutive of a line rather than existing in a line is potentially liberating and kind of frees both the actor and the translator to jettison I am to a degree, but maybe I'm taking a point too far. Yeah, I, um, I haven't thought enough really to give you a, a very sophisticated answer about the implications for translation, though I'm tending to, I think, agree with where you're heading. Um, in thinking that it might allow a certain degree of latitude and freedom to translators, uh, rather than the need to, shall I, um, rather than the need to feel like you're kind of reconstructing the line. On the other hand, you could see that it it might it might take translators in more conservative directions. The feeling that if syllables are really quite essential to the texture of the line, um, should there be an attempt to kind of reconstruct or recreate them in a more faithful way? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I could see trends in either direction, I suppose, or tendencies in either direction. Um, I have thought a bit more so I can hopefully give a slightly better answer um, about the implications of performance. Um, my colleague at the Shakespeare Institute, Abigail Rockerson Woodall, um, has written about what she and others have called iambic fundamentalism um, among actors and among voice coaches, particularly at the RSC. Um, and her book, Shakespearean Verse Speaking, gives, I think, the best account of the ways in which a certain kind of attitude to verse speaking um, took on a, a, a sort of factual sheen to it, as though um, this wasn't a matter of interpretation or advice or counsel from the likes of Cicely Berry, but as though these were sort of tablets of stone that have been handed down in a continuous performance tradition from Shakespeare onwards. Um, think how actors and theatre practitioners sometimes refer to Sh um, Hamlet's advice to the players, for instance. Uh, even though um, whether we should call that advice or not is clearly quite a vexed question. And even though textually that section in the play changes quite a lot across the, the three texts of the play. Um, uh, so I suppose I am pushing a door that Abigail, my colleague, has opened there um, uh, to try to persuade actors that, that they don't need to think in quite as kind of stiff and rigid terms, that perhaps the, the RSC in-house approach to meter doesn't need to be distributed across every other theatre company <laughs> everywhere in the world. Um, on the other hand, um, another uh, former colleague of mine, John Jowett at the Shakespeare Institute, has written really interestingly about what he calls actorly editing. Those moments when actors, either inadvertently or consciously, revise the text as they go by missing out a syllable, or adding in a syllable. How much do audiences notice this? How much do audiences care? How much should we care? These all strike me as really interesting questions. Um, I don't have a great answer to them, um, but I open them up for discussion later. Yeah. Yes, other questions? Oh, 
Thank you. I'll stand up because I can't see. Thank you very much to you three. It was brilliant. Um, I've got a question for Robert as well. I was wondering if you've looked into storm scenes in particular, because um, the um, the uh, the optimistic theory that you mentioned at the end, interviewing on, you know, the um, atoms are very often compared with raindrops, yeah. and if you're naming in particular, you know, to sort of storm in the moment when you know the raindrops sort of swirl. Um, and interestingly enough, you know, in, in, in storm scenes, you've got lots of very simple what's you know, the winds and friction. Yeah, I mean, it's also the moment when the syllables are, are meant to roar, to be heard, you know, perhaps a lot more than in other lines, you know, that they're given a more substantial sort of weight and, and substance, perhaps. So just, you know, just a lot, really. No, I haven't thought about that, but that, that strikes me as right. Um, another tradition of thinking about syllables ties them to breath. Period. So again, it's this idea that, that syllables have a material presence, they have a real essence in the world. These are not mere literary contractions that somehow aren't anchored in the, the real world or the material world. Um, I put those terms in sarcastical inverted commas. Um, yeah, I, sp I suppose that's right. And, and I have seen some, some really interesting criticism about um, actors spit. Um, you know, when actors are shouting and you see their, their spit, their saliva, um, thrown across the auditorium, a delightful thing. Um, but again, there we might see the way in which words are being made material or perhaps syllables are being made material there. Um, and that is part of a long early modern and pre-early modern tradition of thinking about the syllable. But I don't know, Clemence, you might have some thoughts about this because obviously you've been thinking about a, a comedy and the presence of monosyllables in comedy. Is, is there something more to say that I can't about monosyllables in tragedy? Um, um, I... I often relate to what I said at the beginning, so the relation between air and something quite primitive in the puns that you can create sometimes uh, playing with uh, sounds more than with words and then creating a coherent meaning uh, then uh, in a second time. So yes, um, I think um, theater is always at, at the crossroads between something oral and something written, but I think that at the time, so it's maybe an intuition, but I have to continue looking into it. It, it was mostly oral and um, not really meant for printing. So it has to be related to something um, really connected to life, air, breath, and, uh, and yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a question over here, as well, following up on what has been said already in the previous question, I was wondering, um, Robert, that this um, I was connected to was saying when you gave us the example of um, the cello and the porto and the folio, can we say also that I mean, in, not just thinking about future performances, but are, are these not two different transcriptions, written translations of something that's pronounced um, originally? So that in fact, perhaps what we have is not trying to fit the line. I mean, I hear your argument, and I think it's very convincing, but there may be an alternative way of looking at it as two different written translations of a way of saying line. Yeah, we, we need to know, wouldn't we, where those texts came from, whether they are particularly performance-oriented texts. That, uh, and, and yes, yeah. so I was going to add with Christine translated uh, Marlowe's uh, Massacre at Paris, which is one of the few um, plays of the time that is thought to have been transcribed from, um, you know, like, actors, yeah. Play, yeah, yeah, actors' memory, right? Mm -hmm. Actors' their memory. Oh, it's really striking in the text um, that we have, the Otavo, is that long speeches, monologues are very regular in terms of the iambic contender, but anything from between them is not. Mm -hmm. So that we see the freedom there also of acting. And the way they, they, they there may have been focus on the iambic pentameter in, in the purple patches, and how the rest of like freedom is just sort of adapt to what's there. Yeah. And so the editing definitely. Yeah, it is. It, it is that form of actually editing, but also printerly editing is what I was what I was looking at and wanting to get at because I think that um, th there has been a resistance in the tradition of editorial criticism of thinking of some of those early texts as having been edited. Right, the, you know, there's a question about whether that's the right word to use about the folio and the court text. Have they really been edited? Isn't that somehow a bit different from the tradition of scholarly editing, which seems to begin in the 18th century? 
But actually, there are quite clear connections, one of them being the handling of meter, which these two forms of editing, if they are indeed two discrete forms of editing, seem to share. But Leticia, I, was, I mean, I was thinking too about, about your paper. Um, are we getting sort of printerly spellings here? Are, is what we're seeing the, a kind of um, a house style, as it were, in the spelling of, of, of the word? Is that something that may be going on? Thank you. That, that was exactly what I was trying to recite in. But even within, I, I looked briefly at John Wolfe's mm. um, publications in which the term sonnet appears, and I thought it was an apt figure because it printed a lot from Italian material in English and Italian, so he would have been sensitive to those kinds of differences. Um, I haven't had the time to really wrap it up and present something coherent, so I have not included it. Uh, but once again, I could not find any coherence in it because sometimes it's one end, sometimes it's a double end, and Honestly, he would have known the Italian origin. So I'm not sure how authorial it is. For instance, Gabriel Hardy, in some of the pamphlets, it's spelled with one N, published by Wolf, it's spelled with one N, the other two Ns. In the marginal note he makes to one of the books he owned, it is spelled with one N, but the corresponding printed words were also with sonnet with one end. So there's this question, which is why I would like to do more about marginalia, although of course it's even more difficult to collect and actually find than the printed text themselves, um, is this, this tendency to imitate what you already find. Um, that is to say, you see it with one end, you reproduce it with one end, um, or whether you actually change it. Uh, so it, at first I started with those really clear good ideas that Spelling is sound, and sound is meaning, it's national meaning and everything, but but it, I mean, I was proven wrong, so I would like to know what's happening there, if there is really something happening, because I can feel there's something happening, and it's a pity Henry is here because he's teaching at the moment, um, but I know he's been, you know, probing the same territory, and he's been finding those attempts with what he, the work he did on Charwood, another printer publisher, um, that you have attempts at nativizing and sonnet and attempts at foreignizing it. So I would love to do more work with him um, and with Guillaume as well uh, about uh, that. And just about what you were saying, um, I was struck by the, the Duchess. I'm studying the Duchess of Malfi with my students, and we all know the Duchess of Malfi by heart because it wasn't in the syllabus for the Agrivalsmo a few years ago. But anyway. And a lot of it is printed as verse that actually does not scan regularly at all. Um, and it was printed as verse in the original as well. It's not just editorial fashion. And so you have shared lines which are extra American, which do not make sense. They're amphibious to the, the lowest level. Um, but it seems to have been Webster's, or at least the person who supervised the publication. So they're wish to insist on the written, the poetic quality of the text, even if to us it reads more uh, like free verse than blank verse. So I found it interesting that, that what you were saying um, about numbers and once again, numbers and the spoken quality of the verse and numbers and the written quality of the Because when, when you're reading it at home, you don't have the actor to guide you. You're not an actor. You're trying to impersonate an actor, impersonating a character, speaking those words. So all you have to guide you is the rhythm you're trying to hear in your head. Um, so I just, yeah, I just wanted to say it was fascinating yeah. that I was talking about it with my students, saying, telling them to beware. It's not because it's printed as verse that it actually scans yeah, exactly. as verse. Okay. Yeah, any questions? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a series of questions reaching across the papers, but especially um, uh, editors and claim on the papers. And I'm wondering, especially about um, songs and sonnets as a phrase to start, and um, about the sort of the impulse to double but not quite double there, um, which is related to a sort of half of question I have for you about what happens to the T as along with the ends. And how much as we begin to say sonnet instead of sonnet, we lose the diminution 
of that. Um, and that has me wondering about having songs and sonnets and a kind of diminutive double to go along with it and what that impulses. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering there about what that stage is about making diminution visible in the repetition, um, which was something was related to something I was wondering about. I'm also this paper as well about sort of staging the translation into the Germanic works too. Um, to be able to see that in the Slater's Lost, where you have one and then you have the other, so you kind of see that sort of condensation that once is happening in, in real time. Um, so, I mean, those I'm very curious about those moments as something that kind of pushes on the question of miniaturization, too, where in the seeing of moments of miniaturization, you also have a little lopsided. Um, and this is Sort of a connection to Robert's paper too, but I'm thinking a lot about Richard Hall. Don't force it. <laughs> Only if you want. Yes, we're attributing songs and sonnets to Richard Hall yeah. and to what he's doing to Wyatt, which is also going to litigate a lot earlier, earlier too. But I mean, I, I think it follows obsessed with sort of honing and miniaturization. And mm. I think we were just talking about Thomas Husser, which mm. which um, Tal publishes also in 1557. And one of the things that he wrote with Husser is couplets. Eventually, is it got reprinted not just as the old version, but version of the meter conversations. Eventually, they get shorter and shorter and shorter, but then the text gets longer and longer and longer and longer <laughs> that they're being added to. So it's sort of for like songs and sonnets and sonnet, you know. You know they get. Anyway, I'm, I'm sort of wondering about across the papers about that. Dialectic between sort of the multiplication into many things, um, but also the additional things getting in a as the And what's the pattern in watching that? Well, thank you. The, the issue about the E double T E uh, suffix as a diminutive one was one of my initial intuitions as well. I thought, of course, it's spelled one M and double T because it's more directly related to Italian. And then I came across forms with two M's and double T. I had to edit it out of the paper because otherwise it would have been too long. But in conjugation with English forms of adding an extra E, a mute assignment E at the end of uh, words, which was typically English. Um, for instance, you have pens. Pens and songs and sonnets. And so pens is double N E S in the plural. So sonnets, which to me, double T E, sounded, looked more Italian, actually became more English because of this doubling process of the final consonants when it was followed by that extra E, which apparently was typically early modern. So it's it what I've been, I mean, struck by. I've been working on those kind of polyglot texts for a while, is that the what can at first look and hearing look and sound typically foreign is actually also typically English, but seen from another angle. So it's both more foreign and more English, the, the diminutive suffix. Diminutive Italian, but then doubling of the final consonant, English. So oh, thank you. I I, ha I don't have a definite answer for that. <laughs> it's both. Um, thank you very much for your question. So uh, I guess that you mean by staging the translation, this idea of outgrado or grado, for instance. So uh, I'm focusing my research on Latin and English. So if um, sophisticated means long and Latin and uh, rustic means short and English, it's, um, I think, a way to uh, kind of superimpose uh, two uh, layers of um, languages and to blend those two layers and to um, maybe um, combine, uh, elaborate skirmish of wit with more rustic um, way of speaking and to be able to reach uh, many, many types of public. So that would be my answer at this point of my researches. Yes, I think um, that, that's really interesting about Tottle being a sort of miniaturizing presence in the history of English literature. Um, you could make that argument about iambic pentameter too as being a sort of miniaturized form. I mean, if you think where it comes from in, in Italy and in Spain, where you have the versi sciolti and the versi sueltos, those tend to be hendecasyllabic syllabic forms. So there's perhaps a little bit of pairing back there. That difficulty with the final E that Letitia was talking about, 
you know, that centuries long erosion of the final E in, in English, um, so that you often get these, these lines, which you know, might be 10 syllables, might be 11 syllables, depending on whether we hear the E at the end. Um, and, and even some of those arguments, slightly implausible though I think they are, that, that find the iambic pentameter is developing out of the dactylic hexameter, and those sort of classicizing arguments about the, the history of iambic pentameter all suggest a sort of, albeit a very minor kind of miniaturization. Um, uh, I can't resist since, since we're in since we're in Paris, just um, mentioning the Alexandrine too. You know, as another form which is obviously a bit longer um, and which has that sort of similar status of being a kind of national meter. Um, uh, I forget who it is now. I should really give them credit because it's such a good joke. Um, uh, a, a literary critic writing about how, you know, this goes back to your question about uh, the performance of these lines um, and the dramatic quality of these lines. You know, that, that that same claim that's sometimes made about iambic pentameter by English speaking actors, i.e. that it's really kind of breathable, that it's naturally breathable, is also said by French actors about the Alexandrine, even though the Alexandrine is what, about two syllables longer. Um, and the literary critic I have in mind, I think it might be Paul Menza, says, you know, here we have a sort of physiological argument which has the French breathing less often than the English. Um, <laughs> maybe all those Gaulois. <laughs> All three of you, I think we have further questions over here. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for your lectures. Um, I was wondering, uh, um, uh, sorry, Robert, your uh, remark about Othello being surrounded by those two vocal modes really reminded of Ajax. Uh, his his name in, in, in Greek is Ai, Ai mm. which is the, 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 the lamentation he has to express at the end of the play. And so we have this parallel between the two figures as uh, both warriors being taken over by madness. And so the woe is in their name, which I find really interesting. And this brings me to my question about the, the I think the the monosyllabic uh, word most common in tragedy would be, I think, the the vocalic breath, the ah, uh, the o. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so I was wondering about so the introduction in the regular regularization of the of the pentameter of uh, of breaths and yeah. and lamentations. Yes. Yeah, that's. That's, exa that's exactly right, I think. Um, you know, what do we do with these apparently phatic utterances? You know, is it necessary to have that oh or that ah uh, um, in, in the line? Or, 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 you know, thinking of French verse, the, 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 the helas, you know, the, the alas in the line, you know, are these mere filler? It goes back to that thing I was saying about Marina Tullinskaya and the pleonastic doom. Um, on the other hand, I mean, one, one thing you might say against Tullinskaya on that point would be think of um, Wordsworth's intimations, though, thoughts that do often lie too deep for tears. You sort of don't need that do, it's a, it's a filler do, it's a filler word, but part of the emotional force of that line, I think comes from that filler word. Um, or, you know, um, uh, Ben Johnson's, you know, elegy to his son with his finest piece of poetry. You know, that, that, that again, you have what's partly a, a, just a kind of grammatical Form. Um, but again, you have something which might look like a sort of filler word, which produces this beautiful kind of emotional stumble in that poem. So, yeah, it might seem that we can get rid of those things, um, particularly to an actor. Um, but do we lose something in the process? I, I, I'm not sure, but I, I'm sure that we might. Thank you so much. That actually gives me the entree so that I can make a very short point. And that is that what we're talking about here is you know, your argument, Robert, presupposes that there's some authoritative text. And one of the things, I mean, if you want to discuss an alternative mode of reading in which you decide whether or not syllables are important or not, we need to have a text that we believe to be authoritative. For instance, that is for me is certainly not filler because he always titles things and he writes with the his his. Yeah. I mean that's that's a Johnsonian move. 
it's not Philip. No, I agree. I agree. Yeah. And one of the things that you were talking about, Letitia, you were asking, we can't know. It is true. It's, you know, the fact that the folio is different than the cordos. You know, I mean, Eugene Giddens, for instance, has been very clear about the fact of how careful, you know, Johnson looked over that, but we can never know. <laughs> Do you look that far to decide whether or not to have two ends or not? So I really feel that while we're talking about factors and about, I do feel we really need to say in advance what our authoritative te text is, what our corpus is, and then go on from there. Tisha, do you want to? Um, I have an answer, but I don't know if you want to go first. I was not. Yeah. But could I maybe just say one quick thing? Sorry, just but just before that, that no, no, no. I think I think I think I, first of all, I'm, I'm not suggesting that those you know apparently kind of phatic or trivial syllables in poems like Ben Johnson's are filler. But there is a view abroad that those things could be thought of. So I agree with you. I don't think they are. Um, but your question about presupposing an authoritative text is a good one. Um, uh, personally, I don't particularly have any problem with actors you know swapping in and swapping out syllables or even editors doing that i think what my objection would be would that be about editors claiming that their text is authoritative with the changes that they've made and and that's what i'm interested in that way that there has been a production of a kind of authoritative shakespeare that tends to be more regular than the um text and the quartos and folios really are that that i think might be the difference excellent <laughs> Okay, I think we have time for one last question, right behind me. The smallest question. The smallest question. It's a small question. It's a small question. But I wonder if you consider the idea, and this is a little bit along the lines of the Van Gogh's idea, the Van Gogh's lunch, but I wonder if there's a compositorial uh, you know, issue, and that is, and I, I hate to even say this because there's this point creating a really mundane sort of project. The fact that it's a double letter um, invites the possibility that they were literally out ends. Yes. And so the only way to is to inspect the gatherings and go through and look at every, because I was noticing there was a step even within text where you have the double end and the single end, but the same, or then that seemed to be on that. But I wonder if like, the answer by actually doing it. Um, thank you. Yeah. I've thought about that. Um, I've been shying away from quantitative methods. All right. Um, but I, I, yes, I've seen examples in which you have interversions between use and ends. And so you might say, oh, well, I don't know how frequent use are, but maybe if you're running out of ends, you might just use for you in reverse. And last year, we had something about um, Romeo and Juliet, the poison that uh, stopped the heart or something, and because there was a, um, printing differences between L's and T's, so was there a mistake in, in you know, picking from the wrong box, for instance? And that is fascinating. This is something with which I'm less familiar, quantitative studies, also this very specific material part of book history and a literary scholar. <laughs> um, but yes, yes, I think it, it's work that needs to be done. So if I can find someone to partner with. Uh, and, volunteer. Yeah, <laughs> volunteering. Um, that, that would be, yes. Um, I would need to define a corpus, a specific corpus, and then it's a, it's a different type of research. But I do agree that there is this possibility that they had a certain number of ledgers at their items at their disposal, and that they were running out of those items. Well, all right. They had to make do with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, all three of you, for very fruitful papers and thought provoking questions that we got. I think we can thank our three speakers before they. Thank you. Thank on poetic units. Um, and we're looking at subjects from a different perspective than the double and single N. Um, so, our first speaker is uh, Colleen Ruth Rosenfeld. She's a visiting professor of English at uh, Pomona College. 
Her research considers how questions of form um, shape questions of epistemology in Renaissance poetry and poetic theory. So her first book, in Decorous Thinking, the years of speech in early modern poetics, was published in 2018. Um, she's published many articles in um, such journals as PMLA, EOH, etc. And uh, she is currently uh, writing a book, finishing a book. Or it's Let's say writing. Yeah. Writing a book <laughs> entitled Seeing Things Otherwise in Shakespeare and Picasso. But I don't think she'll be speaking of the culture. No. <laughs> um, so uh, her paper is entitled, as you can see on the program, uh, Brandon Dutch Mayer and the Say So of Shakespeare's Honda. <laughs> No. Oh. How about now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for that first panel. That was such a pleasure and the lively q and I'm very grateful to be here. Um, art historian Giovanni Morelli suggested that when we look for style, we might be better off not looking for iconography. When we look for style, we might be better off training our eye to notice the artist's shortcut. Morelli's idea, as I understand it, is to soften our focus on what the artist represents in order to see the brush strokes that clear out the space for representation. What Carlo Ginsberg in his discussion of Morelli describes as the trivial details of, for example, the shape of the ear. I want to talk today about the trivial word with which Shakespeare tied his sonnets together. That word is so. Whether serving as an emphatic designating a degree, structuring a simile, a comparison, a correspondence or a parallel, whether introducing a loosely logical consequence, a relative clause, an affirmative clause, a result clause, whether permitting for the Volta's pivot or loosely tacking on an oddly related couplet at the end, the word so served Shakespeare as an elastic ligament, a multi-jointed articulation that allowed him to torque syntactical possibilities across poetic lines. I want to suggest that the flexibility of Shakespeare's so was also the feature of his style that attracted second generation New York school and avant-garde poet, the great feminist Bernadette Mayer to his sonnets in the decades of the 1970s and 1980s, and especially while working on two volumes, the Desires of Mothers to Please Others in Letters from 1979 and her book of sonnets from 1989. In her attention to Shakespeare's so, Mayer recognized in the sonnets a kind of poetic invitation to think with their stylistic features and to imagine from those stylistic features that the sonnet might become a communal space for queer pleasure. The invitation that the sonnets extend to Mayer by way of so, is the very aesthetic feature that has earned those sonnets a notoriously dubious place in the history of literary criticism. I am referring, of course, to an open secret. What everybody knows about Shakespeare's sonnets is that up close, nose pinned to the page as you track syntactical connections and arrangements, Shakespeare's sonnets make very little sense. This is the aesthetic feature commonly described as the vagueness or uncertainty or imprecision of the sonnets. The American new critic, Jonathan Crow Ransom, criticized Shakespeare's sonnets because their formal distribution into three quatrains and a couplet does not always or even often align with the logical pattern. A Shakespearean sonnet, he wrote, persuades us that this is a poetry of wonderful precision when logically it is a poetry of wonderful imprecision. Under Ransom's eye, an almost kinetic incoherence manifested in Shakespeare's sonnets as a problem of formal parts, a third quatrain that does not coordinate with the first two, a couplet compelled to begin before it ought. Ivor Winters, in turn, described Shakespeare's vagueness in the epistemological terms of uncertainty, highlighting that sensation that so many of Shakespeare's readers experience when the sonnets only settle into sense if you don't look too hard, if you do not press on their pronouns or conjunctions for referential precision. 
and what the American New Critics described as Shakespeare's vagueness or uncertainty, William Empson described as their ambiguity, distinguishing between three kinds with respect to Shakespeare's sonnets. One, those kinds which, once understood, remain an intelligible unit in the mind. Two, those in which the pleasure belongs to the the act of working out and understanding, which must at each reading, though with less labor, be repeated. And three, those in which the ambiguity works best if it is never discovered. For Empson, the beauty of Shakespeare's sonnets resides precisely in allowing any number of possibilities to exist and align simultaneously, while not knowing, even never knowing, which of them to hold most clearly in the mind. Like the new critics, Empson recognizes when the form of a Shakespearean sonnet threatens to fall apart at the seams. He was the first to suggest, for example, that Sonnet 94 reads as if Shakespeare packed the sestet of an altogether different sonnet onto the octave of a sonnet he could not complete. But Empson's aesthetic evaluation tilts differently. Fearing that his detailed analysis of Sonnet 16, for example, will merely spoil what his readers had taken for a beautiful sonnet by showing it to be much more muddled than they had realized, Empson articulates a peculiar and important account of aesthetic pleasure. Insofar as people are sure that their pleasures will not bear thinking about, I am surprised that they have the patience not to submit them to so easy a destruction. Aesthetic pleasure for Empson is not worthy of the name unless it has been subjected to analysis, or perhaps a person is not worthy of the name unless he attempts to destroy his own pleasures. I want to suggest that what the new critics described as Shakespeare's vagueness and what Empson described as his ambiguity, this same aesthetic feature is one that Stephen Duth in his 1977 edition of the sonnets describes as the unharnessed potential of Shakespeare's sonnets, proceeding to describe in his commentary its weird presence across a range of lexical, logical, syntactical, contextual, and formal axes, as, for example, the syntactically casual potential of a preposition, the fleeting potential of a pronoun doubling as an adjective, a potential but unexploited pun, or a potential oxymoron that is not quite realizable. Booth identifies momentary potential, unrealized and previously irrelevant potential, and inoperative potential. At the level of word, clause, and line, as well as their coordination, Booth suggests that Shakespeare's sonnets are vague or imprecise or uncertain because they retain because they shelter within their poetic ontology the potential to be otherwise. For Booth, the various potentialities of Shakespeare's sonnets do not cohere in a virtuosic demonstration of poetic integrity. They neither solicit nor reward an acrobatics of ingenious interpretation that he associates with the new criticism. These effects, he writes, are demonstrably present, but just as demonstrably doing nothing that can be harnessed in a critical exposition of what a poem says or what a poet wanted it to say. Booth's aim is therefore not interpretive, but descriptive. He argues that Shakespeare wielded potential in the way that he wielded patterns of rhythm and form, lending his sonnets extra logical coherence because they create the impression that even as the language of the sonnets ordinarily limits its reader's mind to the terms of a specific assertion, that language is at the same time suggesting room and direction for vast and multi-directional expansion. A line or a passage or even a whole poem, he writes, may disappear behind a veil of uncertainty, but it is precisely this disappearance behind the veil, I want to suggest, that constitutes the sonnet's invitation to the long literary history of variation for which Bernadette Mayer is herself a virtuosic example. So if you could distill Shakespeare's vagueness, his uncertainty or ambiguity, if you could condense it or concentrate it into a single word that Shakespeare then splashes across the sonnet, for the sheer, um, it would be the most protean of syntactical joints, so. 
I'm going to go through a couple of examples pretty rapidly. They're on the first side of your handout, and then I'll slow down a little bit as we get into it. Um, and those are on the, the second side, the B side. I'm interested in the word so for the sheer range of things that Shakespeare could do with it. At the sonnets Volta, for example, as in sonnet 17 and 106, the loosely correlative so might gather the preceding octave together in order to casually represent it in the sestet. Or, as in sonnet 108, so might transform the octave into a series of clauses for which the sestet it introduces is the cumulative effect. Or so might, as in sonnet 52, extend a sonnet's list of comparisons across the third quatrain. In each of these examples, which I know I am only briefly touching on, that shadowy volta at line nine can put a peculiar pressure on the loose coordination of so. In sonnet 33, to cite one more example, the volta's even so turns the full many a glorious morning recounted by the octave into a simile. Even so, my son, one early morn did shine. And similarly, a so that introduces one of Shakespeare's closing couplets is equally capable of insisting on the independent integrity of that couplet, as in Sonnet 18, um, where it serves to gesturally connect it to what has come before. The couplets now are on the second side. That's how quickly I move. Sonnet 57 is a great example of when the couplet's so does both. If at first, it seems as if so offers a summation of the previous three quatrains, so true a fool is love. The reminder of the couplet lets us know that so functions here instead as an emphatic wind up for the final line of the poem. So extremely true a fool is love that he will never think ill of you no matter what you do. The versatility of so in this sense was a kind of cheat for Shakespeare, a shortcut, if you will, that allowed him to tie together the disparate threads of his sonnet. With this one little word, Shakespeare was able to gather an octave in his hands and torque it around a volta, or so might proleptically extend his syntax across an otherwise invisible enjambment. So might indicate something like manner or way, it might denote a comparison or parallel, might harness a continuative force, it might assert a result or a consequence, or it might allow him to measure the extent of something, the degree to which a quality adheres. Before turning to Bernadette Mayer's interest in Shakespeare's So, I want to highlight one of these functions in particular, one to which Shakespeare returns across the sonnets and which we might describe as metapoetic. I'm thinking of the moments when Shakespeare places the word so after variations on the verbs do, say, or think, such that so seems to have the deictic function of that. Here are a few examples. You had a father, let your son say so. Love is a babe, then might I not say so. Though not to love, yet love to tell me so. What means the world to say it is not so? In such moments, so serves to refer to the language of the sonnets themselves. So points to the poetry of the sonnets in a shorthand, instead of saying, though not to love, yet love to tell me that you love, the poet says so. So saves the poem from tedious repetition. And yet the reference of so in these lines is not the pointed finger of precision but something more like a distracted wave of the hand in the general direction of the poem's own words. So abstracts from the phrase to which it gestures, a particular quality without ever specifying what that quality is. It creates in short, what Booth called the unharnessed potential of the sonnets and invites the practice of variation. When, for example, the poet turns to the young man of the procreation sequence and says, you had a father, let your son say so. He is requesting many things at once. He is requesting that the young man conceive a child in order that that child might say, I had a father. 
which means he is also accelerating to the moment in which the young man will be as his father is, dead. This is why, like the young man, the child might use the past tense of had a father. But the poet also and quite literally creates the possibility that the child, once conceived and born, might look the young man squarely in the eye and say exactly what the poet says, you had a father. In this sense, the poet scripts a conversation between the child and the young man in which the child appears to be reproaching the young man for failing to provide him with what he had, a father, while the fact of the existence of the father would seem to be a necessary condition of the child's own scripted address. I want to suggest that so, in such circumstances, create Shakespeare's vagueness because its self-referential gestures turn one line into many possible lines and can even introduce polyvocality into a single line where simultaneously the poet says, you had a father, the young man says, I had a father, and the child says both, I had a father and you had a father. It is this simultaneity of possibilities that coexist in an illogical and irreconcilable fashion that Shakespeare's readers have always understood as the vagueness, uncertainty, imprecision, ambiguity, or unharnessed potential of Shakespeare's sonnets. So the sonnets make vagueness, but this one small word so suggests that such vagueness is in fact an invitation to his subsequent readers. It is the great feminist avant-garde poet Bernadette Mayer who has taught me to see Shakespeare so in this way. And in the final part of my talk, I would like to think about some of the ways in which Mayer relates to Shakespeare's sonnets by way of our small word so. Mayer thinks about Shakespeare's sonnets across her career, quoting from them at pivotal moments in her great poem, Midwinter Day, or referring to them in her 1978 exercises. The first two of these instructions to poets read, and this is on your handout. So they're kind of like um, workshop exercises that she provided to young poets. One, pick any word at random, noun is easy, let the mind play freely around it until a few ideas have passed through. Then seize on them, look at them and record. Try this with a non-connotative word like so. Two, systematically eliminate the use of certain words or phrases from a piece of writing, either your own or someone else's. For example, eliminate all adjectives or all words beginning with S from Shakespeare's sonnets. Combined, these two exercises suggest a rewriting of Shakespeare's sonnets in which not only Shakespeare and sonnets would be eliminated, but also all instances of the non-connotative word around which you might nonetheless allow the mind to play freely. So, in the collection of letters that she wrote during her third pregnancy, Mayer recounts reading the sonnets and describes taking pleasure without achieving order on the say-so of the sonnets. That is her phrase, the say-so of the sonnets. While writing these letters, Mayer does not write poetry. She very explicitly sets poetry to the side in search of what she describes as a revealing lack of syntax. Maybe, Mayer writes, there is a way to write myself back to a revealing lack of syntax. And then she asks her reader, do you think so? Mayer's plan all along is to return to poetry after her pregnancy. She writes, after the baby's born, aside from being able to hold it in my arms, I'm going to extract myself from prose writing and with all the new knowledge gained therefrom, which may turn out to be none, I'm going to excavate some more poetry. The first poem in her 1989 collection of sonnets picks up right around where Shakespeare's sonnet 115 leaves off. I have reproduced both of those poems on the back of your handout. Love is a babe, Mayer's poem begins, as you know. Shakespeare's sonnet 115 recounts the possibility that language will never be adequate to his love because he can only use language to describe what he already knows. 
how can the poet make his language adequate to what he is yet to know? Those lines that I before have writ do lie, even those that said I could not love you dearer. Yet then my judgment knew no reason why my most full flame should afterwards burn clearer. But reckoning time, whose millioned accidents creep in twixt vows and change decrees of kings, hand sacred beauty, blunt the sharpest intents, divert strong minds to the course of altering things. Alas, why, fearing of time's tyranny, might I not then say, now I love you best, when I was certain or uncertainty, crowning the present, doubting of the rest? Love is a babe, then might I not say so, to give full growth to that which still doth grow. The curious gesture of the say-so of Shakespeare's sonnet 115 is to withdraw the possibility of its own existence. No, the poet seems to say to himself, no, you might not say so. You might not say, not ever say, now I love you best. To say so, sonnet 115 seems to suggest, is to strangle the babe even at the moment of its birth, to render that babe still. When Mayer's poem begins, love is a babe, she shifts the referent of so. It no longer refers, as we might expect from Sonnet 115, to the earlier claim, now I love you best, but refers instead to the clause that directly precedes, love is a babe, then might I not say so. Love is a babe as you know, says Mayer, replacing the interrogatory shimmer of Shakespeare's then might I not say so, with the casual confidence of someone who takes for granted that they are telling you something you already know. And yet this thing that you know and that I know you know must still be said, love is a babe. It is as if Mayer's variation on Shakespeare's line allows her to transform his concluding couplet, his conclusive couplet into a new beginning. The anapestic skip of, as you know, is a metrical slate of hand. Love is a babe is an answer to the question that Shakespeare's poet almost asks, and to which Mayer's sonnet replies, yes. Yes, you may say so, I may say so, and in acting on the shared permission of might, we can speak the say-so of the sonnet. But as you know, also radically reduces the space of Shakespeare's line so that a single anapest condenses half of that line into one metrical foot. Between as, the frequent lexical companion of so, and no, which repeats the rhyme of Shakespeare's so, Mayer's answer to the question that Shakespeare's poet does not ask is a brash clearing of the table. She lets all of the sonnet's contents fall to the floor and proceeds with Anne. Love is a babe, as you know, and. Mayer claims in her sonnet a kind of casual artlessness to her style of address. Artless of me to speak so, ungenerally of thee and thy name. It is artless of the poet to speak so, after the fashion of Shakespeare and the way of Shakespeare, artless to speak his words, but so then tilts toward degree, artless because she speaks so ungenerally, which is to say with an extreme and conspicuous particularity of reference to thee and thy name. In Sonnet 36, the poet says, but do not so to his lover, because he is prohibiting his lover from acknowledging him, naming him, lest he bring about shame and loss of honor. To speak so ungenerally, by contrast, is to speak with urgent specificity. As Juliana Spar has written, the particularity of Mayer's address across the sonnets regularly shifts from one body to another, clearing out a space in her sonnets for a queer and inclusive love. These sonnets, Spar writes, refigure lyric intimacy as collective and connective spaces. In Mayer's poetics, the say-so of Shakespeare's uncertainty becomes, quote, the rhyme of the jewel you pay attention to, such that so becomes a way to know. Thank you.
Thank you very much for the paper that teaches us that sonnet could also be spelled S O. Um, so we're now going to move on to our second speaker, uh, All right. Um, my notes, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, Danila is an assistant professor of medieval and Renaissance English literature at the University of Iceland in Reykjavik. He is the author of Renaissance text medieval subject subjectivities, um, rethinking the charm and desire of one to Shakespeare, and uh, has published um, numerous essays on early modern English literature and culture, uh, published in a variety, great variety of journals. Um, so his research focuses on late medieval and early modern English poetry with a specific emphasis on lyric theory, poetic form, and the relationship between love poetry and law. But I'm not sure when you're talking about the law today. No, no law today, no. It's going to be um, the All right, so his title is Scythe Work, Incision and Lyric in Shakespeare's So Thoughts. <laughs> so Thoughts. So Thoughts. <laughs> Thank you very much. There are some handouts that obviously not enough, but in the spirit of this paper, I encourage you to cut them uh, into smaller pieces and um, share them somehow. After the scope of my French. Um, uh, the most ambitious and optimistic, Shakespeare's sonnets aim big or rather long. Their eternal lines can handle anything time's thievish progress to eternity can throw at them. The poems will outlast marble and the gilded monuments of princes, rocks impregnable and gates of steel, and survive wasteful war, broils, and the wrackful siege of battering days beyond all date, even to eternity. Whether the object of preservation is the beloved, the sonnets, or in one or two occasions, the poet himself, Shakespeare, in Remy Targoff's words, poetry is superior to all other means of combating mortality. Admittedly, the immortality of Fabus is not without its problems. As Anne Perry observed half a century ago, many of Shakespeare's sonnets expose the claims of eternizing versus flattering lives. Recent scholarship in particular has questioned the monolithic endorsement of poetic immortality. Still, it is hard to argue that the, against the notion that poetic writing is a tool best suited to memorialize another's beauty and to carry that memory forward, as John Garrison's recent book puts it. In any case, Shakespeare's sonnets measure themselves against vast expanses of time. Eternities, ages, years, minutes that turn into hours, turn into weeks almost invariably in the plural, that hasten to their end. He expects his eternal numbers to outlive long days. What I'd like to suggest today, however, is that this momentous encounter between the destructive forces of time and the reparative enterprise of poetry is often imagined as a micro-poetic event, as a superimposition of two or more incisions, slight, barely perceptible non-coincidence produces the possibility of poetry's participation in time, and yet signals its resistance to time's consuming impulse. Consider Sonic 100. Where art thou used that thou forget so long to speak of that which gives thee all thy might? Stands thou thy fury on some worthless song, darkening thy power to land base subjects light? Return, forgetful muse, and straight redeem in gentle numbers time so idly spent. Sing to the ear that doth the lays of thy lays esteem and gives thy pen both skill and argument. Rise, rest muse. My love's sweet face to thee, if time have any wrinkle graven there, if any, be a satire to decay and make time spoil the despise it everywhere. Give my love fame faster than time wastes life, so thou prevents his scythe and crooked knife. Just to allow that we drop all the S's in the sonnet, you can do something completely different. Um, we should do that. <laughs> Someone should do that. The sonnet is one of the fuller expressions of Shakespeare's conviction, according to James Leishman, that poetry will preserve his friend's perfections from, uh, from time. The argument is pretty straightforward. The muse is exhausted to abandon her worthless pursuits and to return to help the speaker prevent the spoils of time. With sharp instruments, his scythe and crooked knife threaten to carve wrinkles in the beloved's sweet face. As Helen Vendler summarizes this movement, the poem is written in a competitive mode in which, as time entropically wastes life, the muse energetically gives fame faster. But the struggle of time and the muse for the young man falls through an exchange of incisions. That time enacts his power of decay through the work of cutting is predictable, or we determined by the iconography of Cronus Tempus that since antiquity equips the figure with a scythe or a sickle. 
But Shakespeare's muse initially introduces a master of song by the end of the second portrait and is transformed into a scripted figure, one wielding a pen that possesses skill. And as an aside, Shakespeare's octave in this sense record the history of lyric poetry from the ear to the eye, originating in song to the accompaniment of a stringed instrument. It soon becomes a form of writing that sustains its continuity. Sir Philip Sidney, for example, uh, includes a tuned lyre and well accorded voice among the key attributes of a lyric poet, yet he also defines poetry as ancient paper. And as in another smaller aside, uh, the prosodic capriciousness of lines three and four, which describe the muse's plebeian artistic pursuits and are haunted by a specter of dactyl, gestures towards popular verse forms. George Butler, for example, argued that a dactyl is most plausible of all when it is sounded upon the stage, as in these comical verses showing how well it becometh all noblemen and great personages to be separate and models. He concludes with an admonition that if you use too many dactyls together, you make your music too light and of no solemn gravity. Shakespeare's literary critical position here is embodied in his prose. But I digress. It was a small set. The point I'm trying to make is that the muse's activity also draws on the imaginative vocabulary of cutting. She writes, that is, Marx scores wounds the surface with all her might, the word which Helen Bendler sees as an ag uh, anagrammatic inversion of time, opening the possibility of poetry's association with time's ruthless nice, uh, night work, and with skill, a word in which the deadly violence of kill is only superficially masked by verbal craft, but it's sound that, in fact, imitates the sound of laceration. Thanks to Jonathan Goldberg's pioneering work, we know that the technologies of writing in early modern England were inherited violence, so it is not unexpected that incision is the condition of successful operation for Shakespeare's news. Conversely, what time intends to do with his scythe and knife, a wrinkle graven on the beloved sweet face, is also kind of line-making. A writing, a wrinkle, after all, contains ink, as in our dizzy observing connection with Shakespeare's sight imagery in the sonnets, the damage of the allegorical figure of time could inflict belongs to the art of writing. And perhaps we should not forget the, uh, the metaphorical incisions upon which the circulation of Shakespeare's poems depends. So long as man can breathe and our eyes can see, so long lives this, uh, and this gives life to be. Sonnet 18. Numerous critics have remarked how the sonnets locate the addresses and mortality in the bodies of each reader, uh, in anyone who sees, hears, or recites the poems. But what really sustains poetic ontology is the eyes and mouths, cuts in the skin. The sonnets will agitate the lacerations that already exist in the reader's bodies, reopening them to ensure the durability of poetry, and thus young man's beauty through reading, silent to vocalize. To return to Sonnet 100, then, there are, it appears, two systems of inscription come laceration simultaneously operating in the poem, with the two antagonists, time and poetry, seeking to assert their authority through the art of making lines. The economy of their rivalry is at once mechanical, aesthetic, and temporal. It is a question of the application of force, as suggested by the muses' might and time spoils. It hinges on sensual perception, surveying and despising of the Latin speculative. And it's a race to inflict the proleptic cut before the other does, to anticipate the other's incision by making your own line visible or legible. In the sonnet's temple organization, the lacerations made by time should trigger the muse's response, yet she also is instructed to act faster than time's side and not. To read the sonnet, then, is to account for the relationship between the several incisions that have occurred or about to take place. That is easier said than done. Time's twin soul, for example, is puzzling in itself. Assuming that his scythe and crooked knife are two different instruments, how are we to understand their respective inky slits? As parallel lines, like in Sonnet 60, where time delves the parallels in beauty's brow, or as a double mark nestled within a single great wrinkle. Will they be administered simultaneously or sequentially? What about the line or lines or the muses pen? Will those be placed next to time's cuts or somehow dissect the original incision or the other way around? The undecidability of this dynamic contrasts with the tangible concreteness of the last sort of imagery means. To think of this rivalry of lines, I would like to introduce an anecdote from Pliny's Natural History, a text with, with which Shakespeare may have been familiar. The story concerns two ancient Greek artists, Apelles and Cartagena. 
the former, desiring to see the latter's works, travel to Rodin. There's the full version on the handouts, but I'll cut some bits of this. Fontagenius himself was not at home. Fontagenius um, himself was not at home, Pliny writes, Fenimon Holland's translation. Only an old woman charged with the keeping of the mighty large table set in a frame and fitted ready for a picture. When she asked Apelles' name, he, seeing the poor said table standing before him, took a pencil and hand and drew in color a passing fine and small line through the said table, saying to the woman, Tell thy master that he who made this line inquired. On returning home, Protogenes had no sooner seen him beheld the draft of this small line, but he knew there had been there. Pencil, and with another color drew within the same line as smaller than it. Within the woman, when uh, uh, <clears throat> he went forth of doors, that if the party came again, she should show him what he had done. Apelles coming back, seeing the second line, was dismayed at first and blushed with all to see himself thus overcome. But taking his pencil, cut the four said lines throughout the land with a third color distinct from the rest, and left no room at all for a fourth to be drawn within it. Which when Protogenes saw, he confessed that he had met with his match and his master both. The table, according to Pliny, was preserved thus naked without any more work on it to the wonder of all men that ever saw it, although all it contained was nothing but certain lines, which were so fine and small that beneath or hardly they could be served, they could be discerned by the eye. The still features frequently in Renaissance commentaries on art history and theory, although most artists, according to Hans van der Waal, missed the point that they refused to accept that the competition involved nothing beyond non mimetic lines. Instead, they interpreted the work of Apelles and Protogenes as lines that represent something, be it contour, perspective, color, or shading. Uh, Alberti, for example, connects it to the drawing of Avatars. The anecdote, it seems to me, offers a conceptual model for thinking about a number of issues pertinent to Shakespeare's sonnets which I not explore here in full, obviously. The homosocial rivalry of two artists who never meet, which plays out on the pristine surface of the table associated in Pliny's work with the female body. The exchange of silent, ever-diminishing through strikes of pencil and subtlety and thinness eventually evade human sight, a kind of dread from physicality or ideality. The tension between the verbal and the visual, the ineluctable yet ingraspable difference operating within these lines, uh, the material divisibility and eventual destructibility of the graphic signifier, the easy, almost imperceptible transformation of mark into ground, of depth into surface, and so on and so forth. For now, I'd like to focus on the syntax of these palimpsestic lines. In themselves, they are almost meaningless. Their relationship, however, is crucial. The later marks might basically replicate what precedes them, but at the same time, they physically alter the early inscription, dissecting them and drawing attention to their vulnerable material presence in space. Shading into one another, the lines elude to a uh, decisive differentiation while they remain screen. Operating at the limits of perception, these lines are worth seeing precisely because they evade being seen. They also separated in time, while the, resulting, uh, while the resulting table bears all three incisions concurrently without clear distinction, we can still experience history and their non simultaneity in Plinus narrative. Finally, Apelles' almost invisible line longitudinally dissecting Carthaginus is already a thin line to call Georgia Agamben, who reads the anecdotes as an allegory of messianic time, divides the divisions and renders them an offering. It negates the destructive consequences of the early incision, showing it as unfinished, divisible, negotiable, and ultimately redeemable. Without abolishing marking, Apelles suspends the violence of the cut. I would like to use this to situate my thinking about Shakespeare's idea of lyric poetry through the prism of Pliny's anecdote. On this approach, the black lines of poetry, to borrow the language of Sonnet 63, can be imagined as dividing the cuts made by age's cruel knife rather than being external to them. Quite apart from opposing time, poetry imitates the logic of time's side. You may recall here Wendy uh, Hyman's characterization of the sonnet as a timekeeping device. Instead of proposing an alternative technology to laceration in order to counter time, <clears throat> time's violence, Shakespeare's lyric unsettles the separation, creating what Julia Fleming calls the positivity of the cutting. As it divides time itself, poetry's incision creates another temporality that is not fully consumed by time's repetitious cut. 
the music's line, uh, li uh, the music's lyric lines do not cancel out the cuts made by time, rather they modify, shift, almost imperceptibly reform the grain and wrinkle, rendering it not uh, not identical but it's itself. For all the nearly indistinguishable and distinguishable cruelty of the side and the pen, the finer subtle lines carved by the muse are almost unnoticeably yet unlovely distinct temporally and spatially from time's cuts. Thus, the work of the poet's instrument at once follows the type to decay and anticipates or prevents the mark of the mark of time's instrument. The gap produced to this spatial and temporal dislocation is the domain of lyric, fleeting miniature moment of intensity that temporarily deactivates time. In place of inventive, the sonnet proposed preventive, an ad hoc figure, neither pure discovery nor pure conception, but rather an infinitely small sideways shift of the incision made by time and sun, an interval that carves the space of poetry survival. This idea of lyric is the micro laceration resonates with Marjorie Pellow's recent call for input and analysis that explores unexpected relationships of sameness and difference that operate at the verbal, visual, sonic um, level. And when spatial and temporal infrathena tends to the minute shades of difference between similar elements within the text, and I want to mobilize this last sort of avoidance to look at Sonnet 100. Given the time constraints, I'm going to talk about a couple, just a couple, uh, easily several as Jessica Rosenberg uh, points out part of the song. Indeed, the couplet is where the last sort of drama of the poem is concentrated, where time's crooked night is prevented for a fleeting moment, completing its cut by poetry's own concision. Give my love fame faster. Then time we slide, so that prevents the side and crooked night. There is the ability to count for a time, works to assure the victor of interest and cuts that depend on the work of both the other and the man. The first line, composed apart from faster exclusively of monosyllables, is overaccented and underwritten by a tension between rhythmic, linguistic, and rhetorical stress, which produces a paradoxical retardation at faster, the very center of the line giving Lyric a chance to delay the arrival of time's wasting blade. Acting faster, Shakespeare's Lyric art also collectively inscribes or incises itself visually and acoustically within the weights that disrupt the, oh, the process of destruction by unsettling its totality. With fast colonizing some of weights' interior, the letter's absolute negativity is interrupted. Lyric does not neutralize the wasteful force of time, but rather, Small adjustments of its categories redeems. In the second line, the word side is multiply dissected. It signifies a long curved blade by Shakespeare's Germanic spelling, avoiding the Latin at sea as in skin that it's cut, opens the word to misreading as side, journey, time, or even side. The success of remnants of meaning, an invisible product of the word's internal division, cannot be absorbed by time's side. A side fractures its blade, the resources of poetry, metaphor, for example, translate this spatial movement into a form of timekeeping, as time's side becomes just time side. Within the violent cut of time's blade, the couplet carves a seizure, the Latin cadere to cut down, in the form of a pause, a sigh that the reader is forced to take before reaching the crooked nine. The nine threatens life, but the space and time of written language of the poetic delineation of the rhetoric of the page organization prevents a sharp edge from reaching back to do damage, to kill life. The nine syllables, seven words, two commas, seven spaces, and the narrow blank strip of the paper separating the lines, the domain of lyric that, like a palace's cut, divides the catastrophe at a time of threatens. The maritime side will leave on the beloved's forehead, or in his life are inhabited, anticipated and delayed for a brief moment by the incisions made by Shakespeare's own lyric. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so we're now going to move on to our last paper over this uh, second panel. Um, so our speaker is Joanne Hefou. Joanne Hefou is a um, PhD candidate at Sorbonne Nouvelle, and he's currently, so his project, uh, PhD project is to uh, work on um, rhetorics and homoerotic desire in early modern poetry and drama. 
Uh, he focuses on the work of uh, Marlowe, Wilmore Fletcher, Lily Barnfield, amongst others. Um, and today I'm going to be speaking about um, Barnfield. But before um, I um, remind you of his title, I want to mention also that he's um, recently published his first article on Galatea, uh, John Lely's Galatea, so congratulations for that, and Shakespeare en devenir. And so his paper today is on Barnfield, and the title is uh, Richard Barnfield's Pastoral Catalog, Sweet Persuasion and Occlusion of Details in the Abduction Shepherd. All right, thank you very much. Um, so we'll move away from Shakespeare. Uh, I could advise in advance, but it's only going to be for 20 minutes. <laughs> um, we will also move away from the form of the sonnet, uh, even though um, we've had such amazing discussions around the, the sonnet. We'll move on to the eclogue. Um, so on the occasion of a conference whose school it is, to put Shakespeare's monumentality in perspective, I thought it apposite to draw attention to the art of small things of a poet often considered as a minor Elizabethan author. Richard Barnfield wrote poetry um, in the 1590s. His first volume, The Affectionate Shepherd, came out in 1594. In this paper, I will focus on the title poem of uh, this volume, and this title poem is divided into two parts. The first one is entitled The Tears of an Affectionate Shepherd, Sick for Love, or The Complaint of Daphnis for the Love of Ganymede. The second one is The Second Day's Lamentation of the Affectionate Shepherd. So the tears and the second days, as I mentioned, are eclogues. Um, that's to say, poems on pastoral subjects written in classical style. They are composed of a series of uh, cestes in iambic pentameter, I must say, fairly regular mm -hmm. iambic pentameter, um, or IP. Um, and um, each cestet is made up of a portrait in alternate rhymes, followed by a rhyming couplet. In both poems, so the tears and the second day's lamentation, um, the shepherd, Daphnis, um, who is the poetic voice, woos Ganymede, another shepherd, aptly named after Jupiter's young male paramour. To Daphnis's great displeasure, however, and as it is common in pastoral poetry, his beloved does not love him back. The two parts of the affectionate shepherd differ in tone. In the first part, Daphnis is a hopeful lover who engages into an erotic fantasy while he gives in to despair uh, in the second part and moves on to take a moralistic stance. The tears and the second days nonetheless have a lot in common as a sizable part of each eclogue is made up of a catalogue of items that the poetic persona offers his beloved if he will join him in his idyllic pastoral world. Among these, we find notably food items of small size, such as herbs, berries, or meats from small game. Upon closer analysis, we realize that these items are presented as sweet, which connects them to a network of synesthetic impressions in which they take on erotic connotations. So in this paper, I want to rely on close reading of Barnfield's poetry to show how the detailed description of the wealth of small items serves the fictional persona's endeavor to seduce Ganymede. In other words, I will analyze the connection between Barnfield's poetic of profusion and the pastoral rhetoric of seduction at play in his eclogues. And I will do so by analyzing the poet's reliance on an accumulation of sweet details. Um, so in order to do so, I'll uh, first outline the poetic of profusion 
I was talking about uh, before turning to the notion of seminal sweetness uh, and, and the promise of sexual pleasures. I'll then conclude with a reflection on the notion of biological and literary fecundity, especially when it is applied um, to a homoerotic context. So uh, I want to start with um, laying out what I would call Armfield's poetic of profusion. In the affection of Shepherd, the poetic voice is keen on highlighting the abundance of plants and animals thriving in the rivers, woods and meadows of his pastoral landscape. Fishing, for instance, is listed amongst the many activities on offer. I quote from the tears. For if they'll go unto the riverside to angle for the sweet fresh water fish, armed with thy implements that will abide thy rod, hook, line, to take a dainty dish. Another typically pastoral activity is hunting. Uh, hunting small game, such as birds, rabbits, and hares. Regarding little birds, Daphnis mentions are uh, the thrustle cock and sparrow, the long-billed woodcock and the snake, the partridge pheasant, or the greedy grape. The shepherd's fine orchards full of mellowed fruit are equally plentiful. And I quote again from the tears, um, or if thou dares to find the highest trees, apples, cherries, medalists, pears, or plums, nuts, walnuts, filbeers, chestnuts, the beeches, the hoary peach when snowy winter comes, I have fine orchards full of mellowed fruit, which I will give thee to obtain my suit. Before I discuss the sexual innuendos present in these lines, and trust me, there's a lot to unpack, I want to point out that these are merely a few examples taken from a plethora of enumerations. Um, the sense of abundance they create, I argue, meets several aims. Firstly, it is highly ornamental, fitting the period taste for exuberance and copiousness. copiousness. To quote Madeleine Doran, the prevalent ideal of style was copiousness in the Elizabethan age. And in this regard, the small size of the objects mentioned participates in creating an impression of plenty as the pastoral landscape seems to be teeming with life. Um, Laetitia Cousinon Boileau, in her work on the notion of uh, the notions of copia and cornucopia in Shakespeare's work, argues such profusion sometimes emanates from pure textual pleasure on the author's part, as well as, and I quote and translate, sorry if ever <laughs> the translation is, isn't good, um, um, emanates from a desire for copious, profuse writing which seeks to fill in with words the void of what it evokes. This brings me to the second aim I wanted to outline here, because in turn, the abundance of details helps map out the landscape by filling it with life. In other words, it creates an illusion of reality. This brings to mind Elizabethan rhetorician George Putnam's definition of the hypertemesis, or counterfeit rep representation, the counterfeit representation, as uh, the description um, of something uh, as it should appear if it were uh, before our eyes. To put it differently, the hypertypesis generates referential illusions of sorts. In the context of a pastoral invitation, um, the poetic of profusion also turns Daphnis's meadows into an idyllic space or locus amwenus, where scarcity is absent, um, much like in um, much like Marlowe's pastoral invitation in "Come Live with Me and Be My Love," for instance. This impression is once again reinforced by the size of the items I've mentioned. The fruit on offer can be held in one's hand and is therefore readily available for the picking. Likewise, there isn't much threat in fishing and trapping the small game Daphnis mentions. One does not risk getting gored by a boar, for instance. Quite on the contrary, catching these animals is as much a form of light entertainment as it is a source of sustenance. 
So now, as promised, uh, let's go back to the innuendos uh, I've mentioned. Um, so they are quite obvious in the implements used in fishing with the phallic rod and hook. Hunting is equally suggestive. Uh, the shooting of uh, the ivory arrow with the fine bow symbolizes ejaculation. But crucially, sexual double entendres also permeate the mentions of pastoral fauna and flora. In his um, glossary of Shakespeare's bawdy terms, Partridge references um, pears and plums as potential images for the scrotum. The vulgar sense of cock uh, was already in use in Barfield, Barfield Stein. The sparrow was uh, symbolic of feathered lechery, to quote uh, Partridge. Uh, the aptly named Partridge, maybe. Um, and uh, the fish could well be viewed in a similar light. One thing that might have caught your attention is the unexpected choice of the adjective sweet to describe the freshwater fish. Surprisingly, perhaps, it connects the fish to a broad semantic and synesthetic network of sweetness that spreads throughout Barnfield's verse. So I now want to turn to the way this sweetness interacts with the poetic of profusion and how it reinforces its erotic undertones. So um, to do so, I'd like to take a closer look at the stanza which might well be the most graphic of Barnfield's eclogues. It appears early on in the tears of an affectionate shepherd sick for, sick for love and contains Stephens' description of his pleasant bower, which is not only a pleasant space, a locus a minus, uh, but it's also a space conducive to pleasure because of what it contains. Stephens' fantasy reads as follows, follows, sorry. Then shouldst thou suck my sweet and my fair flower, which is now ripe and full of honeyberries. Then would I lead thee to my pleasant bower, filled full of grapes, of mulberries and cherries. Then shouldst thou be my what, or else my bee, I with thy hive, and thou my honeybee. Um, grapes, mulberries and cherries are interesting symbols which I want to read through the lens of Patricia Simons's landmark work on the cultural representation of the male reproductive organ in the sex of men in pre-modern Europe for cultural history. In this book, she shows that in pre-modern Europe, substantial semitic balance was given to testicles and semen, which modern analysis has the tendency to forget to focus exclusively on the penis. The latter, she claims, was actually conceived of as a mere vehicle for the more important, supposedly life-giving seminal fluid. To define her approach, she coins the rather striking notion of semenotics. So going back to Barnfield, with that in mind, we understand that the relatively small rounded fruit described um, should be read as substitutes for genitals. The grapes, as are Dionysus fruit, were especially known as a symbol of seed-filled fecundity and pleasure. A mulberry, similar in appearance to a blackberry, is an aggregate of smaller seed-bearing berries called druplets, um, reinforcing the, the, the impression of profusion and fertility. Cherries, which come in pairs, may be a more evident representation of testicles. The honeyberries, which Janice's fair flower is full of, should be read in the same light. As Simons puts it, when she comments on a detail from a festoon painted by Giovanni da Udine, uh, which I've selected to illustrate Barnfield's lines as much as she's um, so selected it to illustrate her point, since medical theory located virility in the testicles, there was much metaphorical emphasis on masculine vegetal forms that produced prolific seed. If the few critics who have paid attention to Barnfield's poems have been quick to point out the presence of semen-laden berries in his lines, 
you have dwelt on the semantic charge of the fruit as a symbol of fertility in the text's cultural and medical context of production. From an, an anatomical perspective, uh, we nonetheless seem to have reached a stumbling block. Why indeed would we be talking about fertility in a male-male erotic context? Well, the answer to this question lies in the fact that even if there is no chance for Daphnis and Ganymede to procreate, the spermatic imagery still has important implications as early modern medical discourse associated fecundity with pleasure. And this idea takes us back to the sexual, or more precisely, the seminal implications of sweetness, which I now want to discuss. Barnfield is not the only one to have made the connection between semen and sweetness in his style. As Jeffrey Maston points out in his work on the early modern rhetoric of sweetness in queer philologies, one potential meaning of the exhortation for the youth to make sweet some vile is, uh, in Sonnet 6, is, I quote, impregnate some womb. In Barnfield's Eclogues, if the fruit described figuratively contains semen, the substance is conflated with honey, um, as made clear once again in the mention of the honeyberries. In his glossary uh, of Shakespeare's body, Partridge defines the noun honey as the sweet of sexual pleasure. And Williams, uh, in his own dictionary, has it as both sexual sweets and semen. So this makes clear the conflation of gustatory sweetness with sexual pleasure and invites a reflection on the role played by sweetness in persuasion. Um, Jeffrey Masson reminds us of the supposed etymology of sweet, which is traceable to a hypothesized Indo-European root that is itself related to the Latin suavis, sweet, and suadere, to advise. Um, it's self-related to persuade in modern English and um, a little bit more clearly in its uh, early modern alternative to sway. Interestingly, um, the mouth here becomes the locus um, of both the sensual pleasure taken in eating and of the speech acts whose aim it is to convince. The sweet fruit turns the pastoral invitation into an enticing speech, which takes the shape of formally pleasing poetry. In Barnfield's fant pastoral fantasy, the ripe, sweet, honey-filled spermatic fruit attracts the bee, which quite typically for pastoral poetry symbolizes the beloved who is being wooed. I quote, then shouldst thou be my wasp, then should thou be my wasp, or else my bee. Um, the promise of honey, therefore, is the promise of sexual gratification, if Ganymede accepts to join Daphnis in his pleasant bower. So um, we thus see how the rhetoric of sweetness can be used in a context of pers persuasion, where the persona encourages sexual favors from the beloved. Such sweet persuasions work in conjunction with Barnfield's poetical profusion to create the impression of an abundance of sensual pleasures. The poet's attention to detail paints a picture where symbolic genitalia are ubiquitous and where profusion directly evokes semen. A positive response from Ganymede, we could conjecture, would trigger a fecund cycle. More seminal honey would be produced from the union of the bee with the hive. Images of fecundity are crucial to create this effect, and they can very well suit a homoerotic, non procreative, and as it were, wombless context. The metaphor of the bee is quite fitting in that regard, since bees were said to procreate with their mouths in ancient agrarian folklore. In a poem that draws attention to oral forms of sexual intercourse, the bee becomes a potential symbol of same-sex procreation. If 
The union of the persona with Ganymede cannot be fecund in the biological sense of the term. Um, it can be so symbolically. And this is a third point, um, or the last one in, in, the, in the conclusion. Um, this idea of symbolical fecundity. In addition, uh, their union can be fecund um, in a poetic way, as Daphnis's and potentially Barnfield's sexual fantasy gives rise to the poem's discussed. Through a poetic voice boasting much sexual vigor, the poet might be flaunting his own poetic abilities, or in other words, his own literary fecundity. With that in mind, I'd like to venture one last idea. In Bridget, if Bridget Barnfield's literary career was shorter and less fruitful than that of some of his more renowned um, contemporaries, his taste for meta poetry and his engagement with the Elizabethan poetic tradition show that he is no less deserving of our critical attention. Thank you very much. So thank you to all three of our speakers for this wonderful poetic panel. Um, I think it could bear the name of So Sweet A Side or something like that. It's a yep. awesome escort. <laughs> um, I'm sure there will be plenty of questions. Or Thank you so much to all of you. I just um I just have a question for um um Mr. Daniela 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 yes Daniela excuse me <laughs> this one but <laughs> yeah no I I I'm fascinated by the way you brought these texts together uh, the pity with your work on spies I you won't go into detail but I just wanted to um I'm very interested in the etymologies that you have at the back. And I just wanted to know if you can tell me what you see as the relationship between the side, the crooked knife, the incision, and the second meaning, going on a journey, a mishap or fortune, and one's journey on earth. I'd be very interested in knowing. Yeah, thank you very much. Um... I, I think uh, that we need to approach that um, possible and very tenuous multiplicity that is there uh, from the point of view of laceration, which I, I uh, sort of imagine as a at once a temporal event because it kind of takes some time to be accomplished. And also a uh, spatial thing, because it appears in space. If there's no space, there's no cut. And uh, I don't think uh, that the meaning of journey or, or, or travel is extremely relevant, but I think we can see uh, a bit of the movement uh, in the uh, in the movement of the play, and that's what I was trying to, to suggest. That that uh, in a sense, the word itself is internally incised and we can sort of see uh, in, in the space of the word, which is static and spatial, there's also this temporal um, uh, energy, temporal dynamic going on, which could probably be also linked, uh, if go out of a bit of a, a bit of a tangent here, uh, 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 as sort of, you know, uh, meanings that are disappearing because uh, a lot of those are, are now we see obsolete and, and may have been obsolete by, by Shakespeare's time. But the spelling of the word side, and it, it is quadrant of side, it could be something else in Shakespeare's text. It's still really um, sort of not idiosyncratic, but, but it's um, you can come across a uh, word time, which is usually uh, a sort of mixture of S I T H E uh, spell the Shakespearean way. And a couple of other written texts. So, um, yeah. So I think the movement was, was going for 
Thank you for your question. Uh, and uh, sorry, it's more. And obviously, well, the song is about dying, about, about, uh, uh, the, the, about dying and one's life, you know, like journey ending. So that is that, and that's also there. But, yeah. Yes,はい、私はあの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
your letter pleased me mightily 150 different ways, um, each with its own kind of formal specificity provides a, an alternative way of thinking about creative possibilities for criticism. And so at this moment in 1977, when Stephen Booth is um, you know, composing an edition of Shakespeare's sonnets that I think proved a kind of primer of close reading for a generation of scholars, he's also asking a question about what kind of um, what kind of academic writing can be adequate to um, this vagueness of Shakespeare's sonnets that cannot be harnessed into an argument, right? It's not, it's not reducible to a kind of logical orientation. And all he kind of solves in that volume is, is commentary. And so it seems like this moment where, yeah, I'm, I'm understanding vagueness is sort of pulsing with or lodging within it, a kind of variation to be explicated. And I'm interested in how the, the academic discourse of the field went in wonderful other directions. But this question that Booth has about vagueness and unharnessed potential remains and is picked up on, not explicitly, but theoretically, by avant-garde poets playing with Shakespeare's sonnets like Bernadette Mayer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for her, it is, it is about a celebration of queerness. And the reproductive stuff is a little more complicated, so maybe I'll stop there, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, so th this definitely something to do with queer variation, queer accumulation, and, and it's not only adding meaning on top of meaning, it's, it's shifting, tweaking meaning through repetition and through these, these are the, this plethora of, of accumulations that we have in the text. Um, um, and for, for following through to, 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 to what you said, I would say following through to the, the idea on the idea of queer um, maximalism, which I have no, um, no, well, I don't, I don't really know uh, theoretically what you're, what you are referring to, but I do think there is, um, there's something um, to do with that in, in Barnfield. Uh, but this maximalism goes too far in a way. Um, poetry just bursts because because there's just too much and it cannot contain it. Uh, and it's something that Barnfield um, um, shows as well. Um, and, and that's why I was sort of referring to his taste for meta poetry, because he, he, he does he, he does have that in mind. Um, so there in his sort of maximalist queer art of detail that I wanted to outline, there is um, a queer art of failure as well, if I might pun on uh, title of the book by uh, Jack um, Halberstam. Yeah. Sure, this is a follow up enough because it's worth calling in. Just drawing attention to all these notions of the kind of all the papers are so long ago. But the thing that I was wondering about is you were talking about how the this sort of this, this uh, and possibilities and beauty and stuff. Like it seems like in so many of these examples, so in some ways, forecloses on that. It's like it refers back and comes, and I'm thinking here and almost like uh, the, the, the idea of uh, of making tiny versions of large things, you know, uh, you know, really a sort of encapsulating sort of, you get all the repetition, which, which is it running in a line so often, and then it's in, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, and so forget about all that, or and all that stuff is contained in this kind of stuff. So it's sort of become, in a sense, a sort of you know encapsulation of all that. So it's an emblematic of all of the repetition of the excess and all these different media moments because it seems to allow for that, but also it's the moment when we are supposed to then kind of accumulate that box it up and mm -hmm. some, not only when it's in. Yeah. No, I, I think that that's a really interesting idea, right? Like, insofar as so is used to like tie up all the threads, they're they're no longer loose, right? And I think that we're accustomed to to talking about possibility in terms of that that looseness or strayness or divergence. Um, and I think what I'm interested in is that that so can have that formal property, right? When with the the couplet of 126 concludes that every tongue says beauty should look so, so appears to be a kind of closural device there. 
But if you think of it not in relation to what it's doing formally, but what it's doing syntactically, it, it points backwards and it's, it's, it's referential vagueness, like the lack of precision then turns that retrospective gesture into a moment of revision and acknowledgement of possibility. And so I think that's where I'm interested in the work that So can do that seems to be didactic, like it seems to point, but you don't know what direction it's really actually pointing in. And that's what I think um, counters that closural device. But you can think about how it functions in the simile in a, certain, in a similar kind of way, right? Just as so this. Um, but the frequency with which the poem has to repeat that so, right? So that kind of like gives the lie to um, there being only a second half to that simile, I think um, is something that, that I see occurring a lot in the sonnet. Yeah. It's interesting that Spencer is very fond of these so's and thus that refer back to themselves and their queen in particular. And we, yes. we tend to think about Shakespeare and Spencer being very different, mm -hmm. but uh, it may have been something that Shakespeare learned from Spencer. Yeah. <laughs> no, and that's really interesting. I would love to pursue that idea. Um, yeah, I actually, since I have the microphone, if I could ask you, I, I would love to hear you talk about 126 and the, the sliced away, sliced was, away couplets. So, I yeah. was going, obviously, but then I ran out of space. Yeah, I was going to make a mention. Yeah, yeah but I, I haven't really thought it through. There just seems to be so much, but, um, and it's tempting to uh, uh, focus on the missing, but, but I think maybe it would be better if we focus on the difference between sickle and fickle and, mm -hmm. and uh, just a half cross line that is contained within the other one. It is the work of lyric uh, that I think Shakespeare's sonnet is, mm -hmm. is doing. And um, the say that those sort of lugula at the, at the end of the, of the poem uh, imitating uh, sickles, sides, whatever they, they imitate. Uh, I think for me, key there would be the, the uh, excitability because of oh, they mark time because it's the end of the sonnet, it's the end of the young man's sonnet sequence, my subsequence. Um, uh, but they also the work of poetry and uh, who incites which line is impossible to tell and the possibility of a difference is lyric to, to me. Oh, thank you very much for that uh, yeah. reminder that I, I have more to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, this imagery occurs in about eight or nine sonnets, and quite consistently, so there are some patterns that, uh, that can be traced, of course. It's a uh, well, culmination of that is Sonnet 126. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, so kind of leading up to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was uh, an echo everything everyone said about that, that panel, that was really excellent. My question is for, for Johan. Um, I'm actually at the very beginning of, uh, by the way, congratulations on your first paper. Uh, I'm, first paper. Uh, I'm actually at the very beginning of, of, of an edition of Barn um, mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to all these sort of semiotic footnotes. Mm -hmm. I, oh, I forgot to say when I, I introduced uh, that we, we are working on a translation and we hope to bring out a bilingual edition, an online bilingual. Oh, we should have joined the book with lots of champagne. So I was really I thought you, you beautifully described that combination of the diminutive and the profuse mm -hmm. in Barnville's erotic language, that almost paradoxical quality. And I was thinking about taking this back to Shakespeare, obviously, shares a lot with Barnville, might be, you know, writing in Barnville's way in many respects. And thinking about Shakespeare's poetry and that combination of the diminutive and the diffuse, um, particularly in Shakespeare's homoerotic poetic writing. And I suppose the obvious one was Venus and Adonis, you know, where Venus seems so much bigger than Adonis. Is that not being seen through this line about, you know, having like a big maiden arm <laughs> there, how about Christmas? And do you see those, those differences of scale, those sort of sexualized, erotic differences of scale elsewhere in Shakespeare's? Homoerotic writing, maybe particularly in the poems, but not necessarily only in the poems. Well, um, 
Yes, in a way. Um, I was. This is just in an other. So in, in a in a play, uh, in a comedy, um, I, I think there is something to be done with that. Um, with the the idea, um, if you think of as you like it, um, and um, the duo, uh, Rosalind and Celia, uh, there is one who's taller than the other. Um, and so they're cousins, but you have hints at the, at the start of the play, um, hints at a form of proximity, uh, you know, sharing in bed and whatever, whatever that meant at the time, and it meant potentially other things, of uh, growing up together, um, becoming adults together, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so, so there might be a little bit of that, of one being necessarily a little bit taller than, than the other, um, because, because they're, they're supposed to be equal, but they can't be equals on every single uh, in every single aspect of life, maybe. Uh, so that's the the example that that came to mind. Um, and then uh, let me think. Well, I, I've I've done a bit of work on the on the figure of Ganymede, and um, and which calls into question the the idea of uh, well the very age of the two people involved in the male homoerotic relationship with Ganymede being uh, a child, um, a teenager, a young adult, um, being diminutive when compared with the older, um, with the, the older lover, uh, in a way. So I, I do think there is uh, something to, to do with uh, size, different, different size in a homoerotic context. Yes, thank you very much for that. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, especially about, uh, since you, you know so much about Ganymede, about the link between the cornucopia and, of course, his role as a cupbearer to the gods. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, isn't it a bit futile to offer so many uh, promises of amazing food when he will be some ambrosia and nectar? Mm -hmm. And also, of course, uh, I wanted to have a special mention to the sparrow, uh, who, according to staff, who guided uh, Venus's chariot. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, about Catullus, uh, well, uh, that he is sparrow, and how it might mm -hmm. represent the, the Peral member of, uh, of Catullus himself. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me just take down the, the mention of the sparrow guiding Venus's um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so about the ambro ambrosia, um, the Ganymede in, in Barthia Fecos is also invited um, invited for dinner uh, at uh, um, Swilling Bacchus's uh, feast, um, where he will also partake in the uh, pleasures, um, um, drinking wine, uh, especially. Um, so yes, it is. There is something vain uh, at the end of the day, um, and we know for, for a fact, reading a pastoral eclogue in the Elizabethan, uh, um, well, uh, an Elizabethan pastoral eclogue, we know for a fact that uh, it's unrequited love, and that Ganymede will not answer. Um, um, Daphnis's advances, and we never hear Ganymede's voice in, in, in the Aphrox. Um, so, so it's all in vain, yeah. Um, and this connects back to the sort of the idea I was um, I was uh, um, outlining with the idea of a queer art of failure here, uh, because because it will never come to to life. Yeah, I think it's always well. I think it's kind of always. What interested me about um, the effect of Shepherd as a name, he's offering him so much food. Mm -hmm. uh, so, how does he expect him to reciprocate his kisses and whatnot? Is mm -hmm. he going to be busy marching? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so, there will be well, the well, after failure. <laughs> the the marching is a good thing. <laughs> yes, it is, but, but yeah. But uh, uh, then there will have to be this split between your literal and metaphorical meaning mm -hmm. uh, right through the act. Using that, this is absolutely nice interesting. Um, yeah, and also obviously a uh, skeleton would be 
great um, uh, source for the sparrow. And mm -hmm. Sparrow is a logic object. Oh. Oh. Listen, <laughs> thank you very much for a wonderful panel. I think we can give you a round of applause. <laughs> So we're going to have a very short 10 minute break because we have a few little things we need to do on the board. Um, and then uh, don't, don't eat too many cookies and don't drink too much coffee because we're going to be moving over to champagne and other things very shortly. So um, we're going to go out and see you the way of sunshine in the 10 minutes. Um, and then we will meet again here for um, the uh, Master's Award and for drinks. Something. Okay. Sure. First question. Stay on the safety of the clinics recently.